Many people would say, by definition, if, if it's a machine, it's not conscious. Well, I think uh, that's a funny way to use words, and uh, that's absolutely right. I hear this all the time. But then if you ask people, well, what do you mean by consciousness, they say mysterious things. And uh, I think we can explain consciousness the way science explains other things. You work for a while, and you try to say, what is it that we're really talking about? What are the phenomena? What happens in consciousness that I have to explain? And uh, you see, if you talk to most people, they have a very fuzzy idea of consciousness. They say, it's being aware of everything that's going on. Well, we're not. It's knowing what your mind is doing. Well, we don't. I mean, when I talk, I haven't the slightest idea of the processes that produce the words. So how I make the words is not conscious. And when you talk to me, uh, and these sounds come in, and I make sense of them, Yes, I'm conscious of the words in a sense, but I'm not at all conscious of the tremendously complicated processes. We, we ought to have more respect for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the joke, I think, is that when a person says, I'm not a machine, they're showing a lack of respect for people. I'm John Hockenberry. I've known Marvin for quite some time, but not as long as many of you. I trust, um, I suspect quite strongly, that this event and your remarks and the things that we will hear over the course of the next hour and a half or two hours or so will supremely test Marvin's uh, aggressive sense of atheism uh, and uh, the notion that there is indeed no world other than our own. Uh, we all feel him here today, and uh, I certainly do right now. This is a wonderful, beautiful, characteristic, springish, almost spring day here in Cambridge. The clouds in the sky are absolutely gorgeous, and Marvin loved to talk about clouds all the time. If you walked with him, those are the first things he noticed. And uh, in fact, my children know Marvin because of clouds. We were in Cambridge going out to uh, have Chinese food, of course. Uh, <laughs> And it was a, a, a beautiful, cloudless sky when we went into some event. Um, maybe it was the dinner. I don't even know what it was exactly. But uh, we were inside for a while, and then we were outside. And Marvin was the first one to notice that the blue sky had gone away, and that now that we were outside, the sky was filled with these cloud-like things, which he immediately identified those are contrails, he said. All of them are contrails. And he pointed to my uh, twin seven-year-olds at the time and said, see, those are all contrails. Those are clouds at all. And, uh, and, and my children, of course, said, what are contrails? And he said, well, they come from jet planes. And, and he looked out at my daughter, Zoe, and said, you see, nature created jet planes to make bad clouds. <laughs> Some of you will receive a box of, uh, if, uh, I don't know how many are available. I don't want to promise too much here. But some of you will receive a box of uh, fortune cookies, within which are some of the bits of wisdom that only Marvin could convey to us and the world. And uh, it is certainly among my proudest achievements that the statement, jet planes are nature's way of making bad clouds, is in that collection of Marvin witticisms. Um, I uh, do this only out of uh, respect, with the idea that um, you know perhaps it's a little bit tempting fate here. But um, Marvin always, <laughs> always. conveyed to me and everyone around him that uh, uh, humankind's evolution was not some purely biological, you know, are we going to grow another ear kind of thing, but was in fact the, the grand narrative of our relationship with tools. And, and man and women, the tool makers and users, this was something he celebrated. And, and for all the 
apocalyptic descriptions of what AI is all about these days that you read, it's worth remembering that Marvin's idea of artificial intelligence and the inquiry into what indeed is intelligence was an utterly humanistic pursuit of what intelligence is, of what reality is, of what it is that we do with our minds. And the ways in which he reached out to describe them were never anything other than a humanistic endeavor to have more respect for ourselves, as he said in that video. And indeed, the fact that I can wear this, and if you look closely, there are actually ducks on my shirt. So it is authentic to a certain extent. Um, uh, you know, I can't even begin to use this as Marvin did, as you can see from this video. Anyway, if you have a bunch of gadgets in your pocket, <laughs> That's great. Then you want to hang them from your belt, because otherwise they wear a hole in your pocket. And this is a typical collection. Uh, of course, you want to have a laser. And there's a fairly recent laser, which contains a flashlight, so that you use the same batteries. This is a typical set. Uh, you want a gravity pen so that you can write upside down underwater. You should have a stick of hot melt glue, a erasable pen, a 10 power magnifier, and uh, two gigabytes of RAM and a tape measure and so forth. And uh, everyone needs all of this. I fix about four things a day. I assure you my heat sensitive glue, the laser, and all of that are on order from Amazon and uh, will soon uh, be here with me. So uh, it is something about um, uh, Marvin's relationship with all of us that I think that we share, and that is that he saw something in each of us that we didn't see in ourselves. What we want to celebrate here, in addition to celebrating Marvin, is celebrating that spirit of collaboration, that the connections that he saw in each one of us were the beginnings of a collaboration that for some of you have lasted a lifetime. And the great gift is that it has lasted decades for me. We'll begin now with uh, our good friend, Joey Ito. Hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to welcome you to the Media Lab, uh, where we are here to remember and celebrate uh, Marvin Minsky. Uh, Marvin was uh, really one of a kind in his brilliance, uh, his sense of humor, and his uniqueness. And he was so unique that at uh, the Media Lab, we have a, a whole vocabulary around him, uh, uh, adjectives like Marvinesque and uh, nouns like um, Marvinisms. Uh, I think one famous Marvinism is uh, that theory just works on pigeons and Harvard undergraduates. Um, <laughs> sorry if there are any Harvard people here. Um, and I think one of the best descriptions of Marvin actually was by Danny Hillis, who you'll be hearing from later, um, when he uh, wrote the dedication of our new journal, a Journal of Design and Science, uh, that we dedicated to Marvin. And it was, uh, Marvin was like a Jedi Master Yoga, like Jedi Master Yoga, an impish sage with an inner sense of truth. And I, I really think that that is actually part of the essential DNA of our lab and of MIT. Um, and today you'll hear from a, a lot of other people who uh, loved and worked with Marvin and through their comments and, the, and in so many ways you'll really, um, I think, get a sense of his uh, uh, imagination, his sense of humor, and his intellectual uh, generosity. And. Uh, President uh, Reeve, who was hoping to be here today, um, isn't able to because he's out of the country, but he uh, gave me some words to read, so I'd like to read those. Um, Very few people produce seminal work in more than one field. Marvin Minsky was that caliber of genius. Subtract his contributions from MIT alone, and that intellectual landscape would be unrecognizable. Uh, without CSAIL, uh, without the Media Lab, without the study of artificial intelligence, and without generations of extraordinary creative students and his prodigies, his curiosity was ravenous. His creativity was beyond measuring, 
we can only be grateful that he made his intellectual home MIT. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Daniela Rus. I'm a roboticist and the director of C-Cell. And like most of you here today, we at C-Cell owe a great deal to Marvin Minsky, for he was the father of our, of our laboratory. Um, it was Marvin who established the study of artificial intelligence at MIT. In 1959, he created the Artificial Intelligence Project, the AI part of C-Cell, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. But found it somehow does not seem a strong enough word to capture what uh, uh, the amount of energy that Marvin put uh, in this project to make sure it was a successful project. Um, so he co-directed um, the project until 1970 uh, when the project was transformed into the AI lab. Um, and then he served as the director of this lab. And uh, as Raphael said, over the course of all this time, Marvin injected um, so much intellectual le leadership and curiosity, and this lingered with us till today. Now, um, this past December, we welcomed him back at C-Cell as a member of C-Cell, and we were so excited, and we were so looking forward to um, working with him on a new project, uh, the Marvin Minsky Center for AI. Um, it was really a homecoming, and um, Everyone was excited about the, the intellectual directions of this activity, um, which had to do with understanding analogical reasoning, creating new ways for machines to think, and even creating machines that could think about thinking. So sadly, we have to continue this work without him. Uh, but even without his physical presence, his intellectual compass will be what will guide us. Now, among many, many of Marvin's masterpieces, my favorite is Finite and Infinite Machines, a book that he wrote early, in the early days of computer science. And this book was really foundational in understanding and addressing computability. Um, it established a suite of abstractions um, that uh, formed the foundations of the field of algorithmic complexity, which is really fundamental and crucial to the study of computer science. His work on human thought processes um, produced theories, representations, and algorithms um, that, um, uh, that showed us how to bestow intelligence on machines. And at the practical level, this translated into machine intelligence, uh, machine vision, language, and mobility. Uh, Marvin helped design some of the most amazing um, early breakthroughs, uh, from visual scanners to mechanical hands that had built-in sensors and um, the first uh, randomly um, uh, wired neural learning machines, and uh, the first confocal scanning microscope, which is still in use today. Uh, for all of this work, he received the Turing Award, uh, which is the highest honor one can receive uh, in computer science. But Marvin's impact went well beyond uh, the ideas uh, the, and uh, his breakthroughs. He really defined the research agenda that many generations uh, worked on. In 1956, he helped organize a very infamous uh, meeting at Dartmouth. So for nearly two months, um, he and his friends gathered in the woods of New Hampshire and talked about computing and intelligence. No doubt there was some good wine involved. <laughs> so can you imagine good friends, good ideas, and good wine? No email, no interruptions, no phones, Nothing but quality time to think about what really mattered. And honestly, when we invent tra time travel, I really plan to spend some time at this party uh, thinking about what truly matters. Uh, because that's exactly what they did at Dartmouth in 1956. The ideas that they defined then uh, laid out um, an, a network of, um, of research uh, tracks uh, that we continue to work on today, 60 years later. Now, I first met Marvin in the mid-1990s when I was a professor at Dartmouth. Same woods, same ideas, but different people. So one of my colleagues, Joe Rosen, was a good friend of Marvin's, and he had the idea that we could take the AI class down to MIT to meet Marvin. So we loaded them up in a van, um, in a rental van, um, and we drove down to MIT, 
And Marvin um, was so generous with his time and spent, um, spent time talking to our star-eyed students about machines, about intelligence, about computability. Um, he was really such a presence. So in the 1990s, um, talking with him was an incredible experience. He was recording himself and all his conversations. Um, so, so seriously, in the 1990s, he was at the for forefront of live logging before we even had a name for it. Memories like this are what make him um, truly special and much grander than all of his incredible breakthroughs. Uh, when you talk to those at CSAIL who knew him really well for a long time, you hear about a great thinker who was always ahead of everyone, two, three steps, if not more, and also a teacher who was very generous and took the time uh, to meet and discuss with his students. And there's an infamous story um, where Marvin stops to ask a freshman, Jerry Sussman, what he was doing on the computer. And Jerry um, said, well, I'm trying to get the computer to play tic-tac-toe. And then Marvin said, how would you like to get paid for that? And that was the beginning of a lifelong mentorship um, uh, that, um, uh, that continued um, uh, uh, till today. Now, the following year, Marvin put Jerry in, uh, in charge of a project uh, we know as the Summer Vision Project, and this marked a great era for research in computer vision at CSEL. In 1994, uh, Marvin explained his idea of the society of mind by writing, the secret of what anything means to us depends on how we've connected it to all the other things we know. Judging by the standard, Marvin is beyond calculation. Uh, because his lifelong quest to understand intelligence gave us the dream to understand ourselves and the fuel to pursue this dream. Marvin had a clear vision or, of what mattered in science, what mattered in his work, and what mattered for the people he cared about. And he made all those things matter to us. Thank you. I'm going to describe very briefly how a program written by Pat Winston works. This program is supposed to learn by example, and it learns in a rather different way from previous programs that attempted to do learning. Uh, it needs a good teacher. The teacher comes up to the machine, which contains a uh, vision system for describing things, and I give it an example, for example that, and say, this is an arch. Well, the machine describes it, and the description, the structure that the machine builds up inside its memory is something like this. There are three objects found by the vision system. They're all identified as blocks, and it notices certain relations between these objects. For example, that this one supports that, and this one supports that. These are the legs of the arch, and that's the top. And notices a lot of other things that I haven't got time to describe, such as that this block is standing up, and this one is lying down, and so forth. And it records that as an arch. It's the only thing it knows about arches so far. Uh, then we give it another example. Let's show it that. And we say, that's not an arch. Well, the machine can only do one thing with the picture itself. It has to describe it. And its description looks something like this. Uh, to you and me, this doesn't look very much like an arch at all. But in some sense, the description is quite similar. It still has three objects. This one is lying down. These are standing up. Uh, they're all blocks. But uh, there's a very large difference as far as the machine's descriptive structure is concerned. The relation between the blocks of this one supporting that and this one supporting that is missing. Well, since the machine has been told it's not an arch, what it has to do is change its description of arch so that uh, it won't think that's an arch anymore. And uh, what can it do? It can say, well, it must be supported. So this is its first step in learning what the teacher has tried to get it. It now knows that it must be supported. Let's give it another example. We tell it that's not an arch. And again, uh, the machine has to describe the scene, and its description now looks something like this. Again, the description is very much like uh, the description of all the others. There are three blocks. Uh, there is support here. But there's one more relation that wasn't there before, 
that has quite a high priority in Winston's program, and that's contact. These two blocks are touching one another. And again, uh, the teacher tells it the answer in this case. <clears throat> that's not an arch. The program says, oh dear, I must change my description of arch so that that will be rejected. And since the most important difference is this contact relation, it puts in a new relation, which now is must not contact. And you see it's getting a pretty good idea of what an arch is. Already it's a structure of three things, uh, which must have the right support relations, and uh, they must not touch the two supports. Uh, which means that there'll be a hole in it. The program doesn't have the idea of hole, but it has a pretty good practical equivalent. Finally, the teacher might uh, give it a fourth example, this, and say, that is an arch. And the description of this structure uh, uh, agrees with the description that's been building up, except for one small detail. The top thing is no longer a block, it's a wedge. And the program has to say, I'll accept things that are wedges as well as blocks. And that's pretty easily changed by saying this can be block or wedge. Or in the actual program, it generalizes and says that can be a prism. Well, the point of the program is that uh, it doesn't learn so much a little bit at a time as in the traditional reinforcement theories of learnings, which work very well for rats and very badly for people. But for each example, the machine jumps to some sort of conclusion, learns a new relation, and uh, it can learn very fast. It's learned a lot from poor examples. On the other hand, it takes a good teacher. If you gave it uh, misleading examples where there are many differences between the things it's seen and the new things, then it will uh, be at sea. There will be a lot of differences that it could put in here, and it won't have any good way of deciding which differences to represent in its final result. I'll move that out of the way for you. Yeah, just move it. It's wonderful to see all of you. Welcome to our home. I'm Marvin's wife. <laughs> some people know me as Gloria Rudish, some as Gloria Minsky. Please call me Gloria and welcome. And it's just so nice to. <laughs> see all of you and. I'm glad we have room for everybody, <laughs> almost. And uh, I just thank you for the love and energy that brought you here. It's so helpful and healing to me and, and my family. Um, and thank you, John, for hosting us. Um, I just want to also very briefly thank the media folks who make this possible, starting with Joey Ito and Everybody associated, Todd Macover, uh, uh, Nicholas Necroponte, uh, am I forgetting any, Helen Hoffman, the two Kates, other folks that I am not, know, know all the names of. But thank you so much. This is just beautiful. Uh, I just want to tell you, I guess I'll just tell you some tales here and there. Uh, a number of years ago at one of Mike Hawley's wonderful EG, uh, meetings out in California, uh, Yo-Yo Ma came over to me and said, Gloria, would you come over? I have, I have a confidential question for you. I said, oh my God, people do ask me medical questions places. And now, what's wrong? He looks all right. My God, how am I going to find a doctor for him in Monterey? So he called me over and he said, what's it like to live with Marvin? <laughs> Well, I was sort of nonplussed. <laughs> Luckily, I did remember something that Marvin sometimes said in situations where he got general global questions that came to me, thank goodness. And it was, you know, it just can't be summarized. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, I'm going to present or share a few vignettes of, of I guess, life with Marvin. <laughs> and uh, let's start. 
at the beginning. A lot of you know that, a lot of you have told me uh, and wonderfully well that Marvin has changed your lives in some way, either by reading his stuff or hearing his talks or talking to him even briefly, being in his class, etc. Well, I guess Marvin did change my life too. He asked me to marry him. <laughs> and I said, I think that would be very nice. <laughs> and Marvin came back the, sa the next day, maybe the same day, but I think it was the next day, looking a little baffled, maybe a little anxious. I don't know. He didn't get anxious too much. And he said, uh, by the way, Gloria, uh, did that mean yes? <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it did. So just to track back a little bit, there were about five cupids that helped this process. And so I have to tell you how this happened. I was a resident, or rather a medical resident, at Bellevue Hospital in New York at the time. And to pique Marvin's interest or enjoy his interest, I would take him through the basement tunnels that connected all the buildings, show him the old medical instruments, show him pipes that went everywhere, show him an old emergency room that dated back to World War II, secret emergency room that wasn't used. And then we came on the uh, those days, they had ba uh, switches in banks of telephones. So there was a room full of banks of telephones, and there were five operators, very nice ladies, who ran those banks with the switches, sending messages all over the hospital. And one bank was malfunctioning. It was, I guess it was broken. Well, 45 minutes later, it was fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin fixed it. And those five operators uh, could find me anywhere in the hospital at any time at that, once this happened, if the call came from Marvin. <laughs> there were a lot of calls I missed. <laughs> so thank goodness for... <laughs> well, we were married four months later, and, you know, 63 years is... What is it, less than a micro rhabdo second or, uh, in, 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 in the passage of time? So let me just tell you a few little things. Uh, I did, I guess I did also learn a lot from Marvin in a way. It was very heady as a young bride or young married woman to hear some of the, Marvin would, I would proofread stuff and also hear his ideas way, way out of the box. Just wonderful. Not sure I knew the uh, importance of all of the things I was hearing. But when I first met Marvin, I said to my, and he said he wants to know how the brain works. I thought, gee, this guy is awfully smart. Or maybe not so. He was awful. <laughs> he was awful. Anyway, uh, so he also, so these wonderful things were coming. He was working on papers and not quite yet on his books. Uh, Excuse me. He um, also taught me to argue. And I know he taught other people to argue. And he had a uh, young, first, his first Japanese student, a young student from Japan, we said was brilliant, but very shy and didn't talk very much. Uh, and he was going to teach him to argue. And so Marvin's methods, he sort of ran this by me and said, oh, that's great, to come up once a week and say, Marvin, you're wrong. <laughs> and this person is Yoshi, Yoshiaki Shirai, now Professor Shirai, a leading ac academician in Japan, and he's honored us by being a guest here today. Thank you, Dr. Shirai, Dr. Shirai <laughs> Professor Shirai. And we have one of Marvin's later students from Japan, Yuichi Takabayashi, who's also here and honors us for, for, by being here. Anyway, one of the things I learned is that people, I, people who stay home and work are working just as hard if they're thinking and writing as people like me who run into the hospital every day. So that took me a while to be comfortable with. <laughs> but now Marvin had some lunch hours, and sometimes during the lunch hour he would try to, he would train our dog with success, try to train the cat with not much success. But also, he also worked at a hospital. 
there was a doll hospital on the first floor of our brownstone when we lived on Newbury Street. And he would go down now and then during his lunch hour and help Mrs. Giffles, who ran the doll hospital, fill, repair dolls or more to the more that he liked, build doll furniture. And I know he built a lot of little chairs. And I know he sometimes used them to, in, his in his lectures about how you have to see things in several ways. <laughs> uh, well, as you can tell by what the video so far, Marv did make me laugh a lot. And maybe sometimes I made him laugh too. But it was very, over the years, and even to the last, he always had something a little different and peaked. You know, I'd, I'd laugh, and it was, it was wonderful. There were hard times and, and, and sad times and so on, but all through there was Marvin. Never know what he'd say next. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, the other thing that I really, oh, I just want to mention, he was on a panel once with Steve Martin about jokes. Marvin had written a paper about jokes. And Steve Martin gave a very serious talk and a friend of mine who was there, I wasn't at that one, said, well, with Marvin, it was kind of a laugh a minute. So he was, he was funny, genuinely funny. The other thing I learned from Marvin, really, is that he would always credit other people when he gave talks. Yes. Always. Some of his early collaborators, uh, oh, I guess John McCarthy early and uh, uh, Seymour Papert later. And it, it was just wonderful the way he mentioned his students. You know, uh, students are here, Pat Winston, Danny Hillis, uh, Jerry Sussman, uh, Tom Martin, uh, John, Jim Slagle, uh, lots of people, some of whose names are slipping me at the moment. Jerry. Uh, well, Jerry, I can't mention. Anyway, these, 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 there were always slides that he had with people's names on them where they did projects relevant to what he was doing or relevant to, to AI. And something that I tried to emulate, and I hope, I think a lot of other people tried to emulate too. Um, we have three, three now grown up kids Margaret, twins, Henry and Julie, four grandchildren, Harry and Gigi, and Charlotte and Miles. And Marvin really, was, Marvin was, really was a good father, a great father, and a lovely grandfather, and good brother to his sister, Ruth, who's here. And uh, she, gosh, he loved to do, he always did construction. And he loved construction toys. He tinkered toys when they were little, Mikado sets when they were older. But he also built toys, constructed things out of everything always had something to construct with. He, uh, he built igloos in the winter and sandcastles in the summer. Oh, he even sewed clothes sometimes, made stuffed toys. But it took them to tide pools and, and also took them to MIT. And Marvin was very supportive of my working full time and I couldn't take them to my medical venues. So Marvin took them, often picked them up after school, took them to MIT. And many times after school, many times he took them instead of school. <laughs> and I think they learned a lot about programming, sign languages, a lot of other useful things, and made friends with a number of his wonderful graduate students. Uh, Marvin was also, I'm just going to have a little sip of water here. Marvin was also a science fiction buff. And I think he said he never read anything except science, any fiction except science fiction, or anything except science fiction and, journal, and science journals. Uh, and I think some of the folks, the so legacy of folks like Asimov and uh, John Campbell and uh, uh, Arthur Clarke and uh, Lately, Greg Benford and Bernard Inge and many, oh, Larry Niven, many others, were his friends. He felt that they, they talked a lot about the future that he liked to look at in their way, in the, in the way that 
science fiction went. And also, uh, they were wonderful people, and I was privileged to get to know a number of them, too. Uh, however, if you look at Marvin's books, you'll see quotes from many other people. Uh, they're full of quotes from literary people and religious people and so on. So you'll find things from not just, from the, not just references like Feynman and Tinbergen and uh, um, Albert Einstein and so on, but he had, ref he had quotes from Buddha and Socrates and Aristotle and St. Augustine and, oh my God, <laughs> Seaman de Beauvoir, poets, or the local poets, Ted Melnichuk, who isn't here, and um, Emily Dickinson, Massachusetts people. So his book is full of these, and he read these. I know he read them, because I know <laughs> some, were borrowed, some were borrowed from the library and are still in our house. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, between Society of Mind in uh, 1985 or 6 and um, uh, the, uh, the, connect the Motion Machine in 2006, Marvin co-wrote a science fiction, short science fiction novel with Harry Harrison. Now, Marvin wrote the fiction, Harry wrote the... I mean, sorry, Marvin wrote... <laughs> whoops! <laughs> Mar <laughs> Marvin wrote the science, Harry wrote the fiction. And it's, a, it's, it's called the Turing Option, one of the people, people Marvin so admired. And it's, uh, it's kind of nifty. It came out in 1993, and it's kind of nifty. <laughs> so last vignette is Marvin as a musician. Now, he played some music, and Todd is going to talk about Marvin and music. However, I'm talking about Marvin, the piano detective. Marvin could sniff out a piano no matter where it was. And for those of you who have had us to dinner and to, to parties, Marvin would find, if it, even if it wasn't the living room, he'd go find it in another room upstairs, downstairs in the family room, in the garage, any place. And he'd do his fugue, fugal improvisations, which people know and love, and were so nice, so great. Um, well, he'd find these pianos in restaurants. He'd find them in hotel lobbies, he'd find them in corporate suites, any place, and he'd sit down and, and play. And very often he got clapping afterwards because people thought he was part of the entertainment. <laughs> and then he'd get requests for, um, for songs. And so he'd start out with a melody, and pretty soon it was a beautiful three-part fugue. <laughs> and people still liked it. I remember Happy Birthday came in maybe about five or six versions, because that was one that was popularly asked for. I don't think any one of them was the same, <laughs> including the one when I had a birthday. <laughs> uh, so when, um, we were in a restaurant in Prague, and Marvin did his, he played the piano, and everyone clapped. And then a young couple came over to him and asked him to play at his wedding. <laughs> and Marvin was getting the information and I'm very sad. I had to remind him that we were leaving Prague the next day. <laughs> anyway, that's well. Those are <laughs> those are vignettes. So I'm. I that's kind of enough <laughs> vignettes, I think. So the last thing I'm going to do, uh, actually, is to read a message that came to me a few days after Marvin passed away, and uh, it's from. Bono of you too, and let me read it to you. The, uh, just heard the news in Kalini Bay, Dublin, of Marvin's passing. It's, a, it's wild and rainy here, stormy. Friends on airplanes can't land. Marvin will never land. So down to earth, Marvin, so down to earth. His ideas slowly landing on people like myself and so many others, ideas that would give us flight. I know a little bit about grief. There's no end to it. And that's how I know there's no end to love. And I thank you for the love and the energy that has brought you here to keep Marvin's life and his ideas and his legacies alive and vibrant and 
I guess, sparkling. Thank you so much. We promise you we will leave this living room the way we found it. <laughs> You'll have no cleaning up to do. I guarantee it. Jacques Dambois, who was to be here today, uh, could not come because uh, his uh, health has prevented him from doing it. But I wanted to read a little bit of a story before we hear from uh, uh, Pat, because so many people sent messages just like the one from uh, Bono. And this one, I think, uh, uh, coming off of some of the great stories that Gloria told will resonate with a lot of you. This is from uh, George Benford, uh, who wrote so many science fiction novels. And Marvin is mentioned in the acknowledgments of so many of, of Benford's books. He wrote this, and it's called The Minsky Coleman Worst Driver Study. I shall always remember, both as a physicist and as a writer, Marvin's trenchant comments on a novel of mine. Quote, thank you for sending me a copy of your book. I'll waste no time reading it. <laughs> it works. But there is new science to be revealed, even as we remember him here. Neither Marvin nor another old friend, Sidney Coleman, Harvard particle physicist, knew that a small coterie of their friends carried out experiments to measure precisely the worst Bostonian driver index for these extraordinary characters. Our carefully considered observations occurred on the streets of Cambridge and Boston. A typical incident begins with swerves and narrowly averted scrapes, sometimes yielding curb jumping forays into parks alleyways, soccer fields, and the odd laundromat. <laughs> Friends and horrified passengers alike had long noted the distracted trajectories of Marvin piloted cars down through the collisional decades. Our initial intent as physicists and mathematicians was to measure the stochastic component of the many dented and damaged vehicles in which Marvin carried us usually to dinner. While beguiled by his transcendent rolling sentences rich in ideas, we noted pale, frightened faces pressed to the windows of nearby cars, squealing brakes, angry shouts, and blaring horns. And here was the clue. Those horn signals gave us our method, acoustic measurements of the horn amplitude while weaving down, say, Massachusetts Avenue, as we from the South term it, clearly established the unique turbulence attendant to a Minsky outing. Independent observers, among whom I am proud to number myself, soon established that the noted theorist Sidney Coleman also had a comparable horn blare index, with perhaps a trifle more of the delightful Cambridge obscene shouts hurled into the mix as well. Our thoughts turn to experiment. Assemble a few couples, so two cars are needed to get to the Valhalla of the evening's favorite restaurant. Thus, Minsky and Coleman would be on the same road at the same time and could be independently evaluated. Did the horn blare index increase merely linearly, a simple sum, or was there a collective effect the world of physics yearned to know? <laughs> These decisive experiments involved much fender bender damage through several years, adjusting for climate, inebriation, and general hilarity, of course. The results were decisive. A coherent effect. The minsky coleman horn blare index scaled as the square of the sum. Subsequent publication in the Journal of Irreducible, Irreproducible Results brought nods of wry acknowledgment. Those of us who knew both these grand figures now regret their absent, absence, for further experiments are impossible, unless, of course, there is a heaven with, alas, Bostonian traffic. Purgatory, perhaps. <laughs> and perhaps Marvin is swerving and weaving still somewhere. Patrick.
Well, John, uh, thank you for the clarification. I am Patrick Henry Winston. I'm certain of it, uh, even though the program is a little bit confused. I, um, I was um, talking with Doug Regan yesterday, and he took me to uh, Marvin's homepage and um, showed me the list of 75 students. I'm sure it's a subset. I'm sure it's not complete. And Doug pointed out that you could populate, and, and, and it's true that uh, many prominent places have been populated by those 75. Uh, when I first thought about what I might talk about today, I thought, well, um, I'll talk about uh, Marvin's intellectual legacy. But then it occurred to me I would need five hours, not just five minutes to do that. So I decided instead to tell you a little bit about what it was like to be among those 75. It's, um, it's an intensely personal story, but I think it's a story that's not unlike uh, uh, the story that would be told by many of the others. And it's also um, a story about how a, a, a very small number of words from uh, someone like Marvin can have a, a huge influence on somebody's life. It all started when I was um, a graduate student but didn't know why. I, had, um, I hadn't really any clue about what I wanted to do. And uh, my father was beginning to talk, talk darkly about law school. And <laughs> I um, was fortunate enough um, at that time to have a friend of mine uh, suggest that um, I go with him to a class he was taking on artificial intelligence. And so I did. I went to that class. And I was, uh, of course, um, mesmerized. And at the end of the class, when we were walking out, I said to my friend, I want to do what he does. It was an epiphanous moment. I uh, didn't quite know what to do about it, though. Uh, so I thought, well, I guess the first step would, should be that I'll, I'll take this course. And I did. And I tried to uh, be as conspicuous as possible. I sat in the front row, uh, right in the center. I uh, nodded frequently. <laughs> Every once in a while, I would timidly ask a question, but I couldn't seem to get any traction no matter what I did. Marvin didn't notice me. So. Um, uh, beginning to get uh, more and more worried about what was going on, uh, the end of the semester approached, and um, I was uh, apprehensive about how my term paper would be received. And I got it back, and, and, and there it was, um, a grade and only one comment. Uh, would you like a summer job in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory? It took uh, about a nanosecond to, to <laughs> make that decision, and I soon found myself uh, not only being um, a graduate student in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory um, and uh, partaking of the wonderful environment, the, the magical environment that had been produced by Marvin and uh, Richard Greenblatt, Tom Knight, Russell Nofsker. Uh, it, was a magical, it was a magical time. Uh, people uh, in the other Cambridge wanted to be in this Cambridge. People in this Cambridge wanted to be in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. People in the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory uh, were there all night. Um, it was a very bonding and um, amazing experience. And eventually, I uh, wrote a thesis proposal. And uh, the subject I proposed to study was um, uh, how a program might build descriptions of structures in the blocks world. And there was a, a footnote in the thesis proposal that muttered something about how those structural descriptions might make it possible to learn something. It's a footnote. And Marvin didn't say much about the proposal, but um, indicated I should go ahead. So go ahead, I did. And I, I um, like everyone else, uh, worked all night, worked all day, uh, had a lot of fun doing it. But I, 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 um, I didn't have much actual direct interaction with Marvin. And the reason was I was frightened of him. He was so smart. It was scary. And if you are a little bit shy like I was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was difficult to strike up a conversation. He, he had a short attention span. Uh, it was just, it was, it, was, uh, it was unreasonable, of course. It was unnatural, because uh, Marvin was not uh, just a genius. He was a, a kind genius, and he was a fun genius. And he had a, a lot of those kinds of properties that should have made me at ease, but I, but I was not. But nevertheless, uh, time went on, and I, I reached a point where I thought uh, I might have something that uh, Marvin could close his eyes and sign as my thesis supervisor. And so I, um, I uh, put a copy of uh, a draft on his desk, and he lost it. <laughs> and I, 
you know, I put another copy on his desk and he lost that too. And this was, um, this was uh, not good because in those days, your thesis was printed out on a Model 32 teletype. And the Model 32 teletype, if you've ever worked with it, has a tendency to jam. So it took several hours to print out a copy of my thesis. So uh, I hit on the idea that the next time, I think it was the third or fourth copy I printed out, I would, um, I would attach to a brick. <laughs> uh, so he couldn't lose it. In fact, um, I have here uh, the very brick, in case you think I'm kidding. <laughs> and of course, it had, a, it had a label attached to it, Frontispiece and Retrieval Aid for Winston's Thesis. <laughs> Evidently, Marvin got a kick out of it uh, because he, he did read it at that point. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Margaret Minsky read it too. Um, she can spell and I can't, so. When it came back, it had a lot of comments from, from Marvin on the content and from uh, a lot of harsh criticism from Margaret about the spelling. <laughs> but I, um, alas, uh, I couldn't quite tell from the comments if he liked it or not. Uh, but it seemed like the natural thing to do was to proceed with uh, some kind of thesis defense. So this was uh, what, I, what I thought was going to be my last term as a, as a graduate student, a PhD student. And I began to think, well, maybe I should uh, Maybe I should think about a job. And uh, my father uh, thought I should think about a job, too. <laughs> he kept saying, um, what exactly are you going to do when you get your diploma? And I ultimately said, well, in the long run, I have no idea. But in the short run, on the very day it happens, I think I'll drink a lot. <laughs> so um, the uh, appointed day arrived, and I uh, presented myself for my thesis defense. And in those days, things were rather informal. Uh, my thesis defense seemed to be consisting of uh, having lunch with Marvin and Seymour. And uh, they talked a little bit about my thesis, asked me a question, but mostly they talked about other stuff. <laughs> so I thought, well, this isn't going very well. <laughs> and as the uh, end of the lunch uh, approached, uh, somewhat to my relief, um, Marvin then said, uh, oh, by the way, would you like to be on the faculty here? <laughs> well, this must have been uh, the second most thrilling moment of my life with that uh, comment on my term paper being the third most thrilling moment of my life. But this was the second most thrilling moment of, of my life. And of course, it uh, made it possible for me to interact with Marvin over the next several decades to be his friend, his colleague, and admirer. And during that time, um, I sometimes thought, what will people say about all this a thousand years from now? And I soon concluded what they would say is that Alan Turing told us that we could make computers intelligent, and Marvin told us how to do it. And uh, he told us how to do it from, the, from, from 1961 on. In 1961, we had the paper Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence, and it was a grand recipe for what we should do for the next 20 or 30 years. And then uh, before that, I, I, before that, as uh, Daniela said, uh, we had the um, Computation Infinite Machines. And we soon after that had the Perceptron book. And then we had um, the Frames paper, which is uh, full of ideas that I use every day. And then we had the K-Line paper. Uh, one of the things I find most intriguing about Marvin's work is the statement that what we do when we think as we put ourselves back in the partial mental state we were in before when we thought about a similar problem. And then we have, um, we have um, the Society of Mind and the Emotion Machine, uh, fabulous books that will keep us uh, busy for decades to come because they're like diamond mines. Uh, they're full of uh, ideas, uh, some of them rough, some of them needing polishing and cutting, but uh, all of them uh, stimulating and provocative, and, uh, and, and they're ready for us to, to, to mine and polish and uh, make into gems. If I were uh, forced to summarize those books in a single word, I'd say they're about multiplicities, because Marvin always uh, said that um, there's no one way to do anything. Uh, we need uh, many ways of uh, reasoning. We need multiple levels of thinking. Uh, we need lots of representations. 
Uh, so that theme of multiplicity runs through all of those, both of those books and all of his work. Uh, another uh, thing that I would uh, hasten to add about those books is that uh, Marvin was always talking about uh, what he called suitcase words. He uh, believed that words like intelligence, consciousness, emotion, these are all labels for concepts that are so big they're like giant suitcases you can stuff anything into. And that's, a, I think, an extraordinarily good way of thinking about intelligence and creativity and uh, emotion. Because it says uh, to me that um, when someone says, is uh, Deep Blue intelligent? Uh, is the Watson Jeopardy playing program intelligent? Is uh, AlphaGo intelligent? The immediate answer is yes. They have a kind of intelligence. But there are lots of kinds. And having worked those things out, uh, we have uh, not yet uh, finished the job. So um, that's uh, something about uh, the legacy. Uh, but there's another kind of legacy, too. And for that, I have to take you back to the list of 75. And not just the list of 75, but everybody who interacted with Marvin. Uh, it was my experience that being a graduate student, um, the first thing that I started thinking about when I came into the laboratory is, well, thoughts kept coming to my mind, such as, um, what did Marvin mean by that? <laughs> and then uh, after a while, I found myself in conversation with other students. And we would say, what would Marvin think about this? And then after a while, we would all absorb the biases and the stories and the ways of thinking and the insights. And we would just start thinking like Marvin thought. And I, I, I suppose I flatter myself to think that I think like Marvin thinks. But uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that, it, at least in a small measure, it must be true. And the reason I think so is that a few years ago, um, Marvin and I were over at BU at a um, celebration of Alan Turing's 100th birthday. And Marvin gave a talk, and then um, I gave a talk. I, I spoke about uh, my work on story understanding and my reasons for believing that uh, uh, story understanding, our story competence is the defining characteristic of human intelligence. I talk about how it related to uh, what Marvin was thinking. And after that talk, I didn't really know uh, if it uh, was successful or not, because in the end, there was a room full of people, but I was only speaking to one. And not much happened there for a while, but uh, some uh, some time later, uh, I had Marvin in uh, to talk uh, to my students. I uh, teach a um, I teach the undergraduate artificial intelligence subject here at MIT, and it's a it's a big class. It's uh, taught over in room 10250 under the Great Dome. It's MIT's largest and best lecture hall, and I always like to have Marvin come in because I, I wanted my students to see. Uh, well, to see Marvin, listen to him, see how he thought. And the last time um, Marvin came in, I, I uh, decided I would uh, tell the story about the first time I heard Marvin speak. And, and I told the story about that day when my friend took me that lecture, and I left saying to, to him, I want to do what he does. And I told the story, and then I handed the floor to Marvin, and then I sat down. And then Mar Marvin started to speak, and he said, we've come full circle. I want to do what you do. And that was the most thrilling moment of my life. I'm a very notorious Japanese Yoshiaki Shirai. <laughs> oh, I didn't expect this kind of uh, <laughs> celebration because in Japan we have a similar uh, this, uh, ceremony, but at that time some people may cry, but no one laughs like this. <laughs> so let me talk about. Japanese style, OK? Mm. So uh, <clears throat> I, yes, the Minsky has been my teacher and friend for more than 40 years. Okay? Uh, I met him in 1971. 
when I stayed at his laboratory one year. But before that, I read some articles of his articles. Uh, for example, the paper, Steps Toward Artificial Intelligence, that Minsky told me after he wrote that paper, the best peop people in, Jap uh, in the world gathered to his laboratory. And also I read when I was working on robot vision at the Electro Electrotechnical Laboratory, I read the progress report that he pointed out that most computer vision often make mistakes. The conventional computer vision program has a fault, that is, it has a hierarchical structure like this. Right? So in hierarchical structure, first features are extracted, then it is organized as a kind of line drawing, and then finally interpreted as three-dimensional object. So if the lower level makes error, it propagates to upper levels and never collect, corrected. So this is the starting point of my research life. So based on this lesson, while I was staying at his laboratory, I tried to recognize uh, blocks using heteroarchical method. Okay. When, when work finished, I showed the result to Patrick Winston. He suddenly understand the situation as usual and called Minsky. And looking at my demonstration, Minsky was very glad. And on the spot, he invited me to his house. Not like that, but. <laughs> <laughs> and where I met Gloria and three children. And I remember very pleasant, ple pleasant evening uh, with them. Later, he was invited to Japan many times to give lectures and talks. The, among them, the Japan Award ceremony might be unique. Japan Award is a kind of Nobel, Nobel Prize in Japan. Japan And you can see the <laughs> glory and Minsky, okay? Uh, I smile. <clears throat> and I was one of about 30 members of the selection committee. After Minsky was selected as a winner, I was appointed to support the ceremony and plan related events. Maybe uh, in the back, you, you may find me, OK? So during, uh, yes, when, while uh, Marvin and Gloria are visiting Japan, we attended many events, including a banquet with the emperor and empress. <laughs> this may be the last visit of, uh, yes, Minsky in Kyoto, and this organized, arranged by Takebayashi. Now he is sitting around there today. So this is the last visit to Cambridge together. So once Minsky and I talked about AI and agreed that there is not a law that govern AI. Minsky said, AI is complex and constitutes of many micro theories. So I am sure that he must be very happy to find the AI and challenge the difficult 
an attractive target. Thank Marvin and you. Yes, there are people who need a vacation. <laughs> I've never felt the need for a vacation because everything is different every minute. I've had that feeling called happy, but I find it's really creepy. <laughs> the worst thing is being happy. You have to, you have to shake it off quickly or... <laughs> You might get addicted. <laughs> I have no explanation for that picture. Uh, <laughs> apparently things happen at the little conference that I run that I should probably disavow, but I don't, I don't know why he chose the color of the hat. Lose the picture, please, and put up something more. Not that one. Save that for the end. Um, the regular picture that used to be there. There we go. Um, I'm Michael Hawley. Marvin was my advisor, my mentor, uh, friend, kind of my other father, uh, and my landlord, incidentally. I lived in that house. Uh, it wasn't nearly as neat and tidy when I was there. Maybe it, When I was there, it was sort of like FAO Schwartz after the bomb had gone off, uh, but in, in a nice way. There was always things to play with. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking in the shower the other day, where I do all of my valuable thinking, as we all do, that um, there are some people who know uh, a little about a lot, and other people who know a lot about a little. And which is better? Would you rather be one or the other? I think it depends to some extent on how old you are. Uh, but a lot of folks wind up knowing a lot about a little. You know, they become professors. They become professionals. They become specialists. And there are other points on that continuum. There are plenty of people that uh, don't know much about anything. Uh, and then there are people who know a lot about everything, and they delight in learning a lot about many things. And obviously, Marvin was in that bucket. And I think there are certain characteristics that uh, many of us knew and loved. You, you have to be open and receptive to all sorts of unexpected things. And so along those lines, I have three uh, just three little anecdotes and one story. The story is uh, a significant one for me since it was about the major turning point in my life. Uh, but little anecdotes. I, uh, just after Marvin passed away, I uh, sent a note to a friend who, uh, who knew Marvin as well. I didn't hear anything back for several weeks. Finally, I get a note. Uh, and he said, you know, uh, I've never forgotten the evening that you and I went out to dinner with Marvin and Gloria and John Cage. He said, uh, John was a kind of unusual composer, <laughs> to put it mildly. Uh, and he said, we were there with John, and he was prattling on about his wacky macrobiotic diet with this delightful twinkle in his eye. And then he shifted gears and began explaining his theory of interplanetary travel, which involved building a spaceship that would be a perfect sphere. And it was so perfect in its spherical shape that it would effortless, effortlessly float from one planet to the next. Isn't that wonderful, Cage said. And uh, Olin said, you know, that was without question the most bizarre and unforgettable evening of my life. But the thing is, for Marvin, it was just Thursday. And, <laughs> and in the course of being the graduate student in residence in the house, there was a constant parade of crazy people there. But when, when no one was around and I had to answer the phone, I'd pass the messages on to Marvin. Marvin, uh, Gene Roddenberry called. He wants to talk to you about this data character. And Alvy Ray Smith is coming by. Umberto Eco wants to have dinner. Whatever. And, and I think that speaks to a person who, who knows how to welcome the unlikeliest experts. And uh, that was a a big lesson for me. It, it took a long time for it to sink in, but I, I learned a tremendous amount just sort of through the floorboards. Here's the story. Um, I was uh, 22 or 23 when I met Marvin. Uh, this was a little over 31, 32 years ago. 
And interestingly, he was probably the same age then that I am now, give or take a year. Uh, and I met him because of Margaret. Margaret had been a gad about hanging out at all the cool places in Silicon Valley. I, at the time, was working at Lucasfilm, hacking on digital movies with, uh, with the team there. Uh, but I'd done it for three or four years, and I felt the urge to go to graduate school. I, I really I was angling that way. I thought that I should get back into real research and education and teaching and learning. And I figured, you know, why mess around? Why don't I just take a look at every place? As an undergraduate, I'd never visited any schools at all. And I thought, this time I'm going to do what you're supposed to do. I'll go check them all out. And so I lined up a couple of speaking opportunities for myself. Uh, I was sort of a hotshot programmer from an interesting place. So there was a little demand. And I had a, a talk arranged at Princeton and one at Yale. And quickly, the dance card filled up. There was Cornell and Caltech and Stanford and Berkeley and other places, University of Washington. Uh, I remember Cornell vividly, partly because I arrived in the middle of a blizzard and got snowed in an extra day and bluffed my way into the Carillon Tower and played the bells. Uh, nice talk, met the computer graphics guys. But I also met Carl Sagan and, you know, swoon. It's hard not to be thrilled by the idea of exploring beyond our planet. We're the first generation of humans to be able to do that. It's one of the most profound endeavors of all. And so I left Cornell with my head spinning, uh, went down to San Diego and gave a talk there, and had a very fleeting encounter with Francis Crick, uh, who was studying brains. But it was the first time I'd thought of biology in a way that just didn't have you know, much to do with growing tomatoes. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was another field that was clearly going to unfold. And we would be the first generation of people to engineer new life forms. That seemed pretty interesting. I get back to Lucasfilm. My head was sort of spinning. And in the course of a couple of weeks, a whole assortment of folks kind of wafted through. Don Knuth and John Chowning from Stanford. I met um, lots of them. Richard Feynman came by. And at the time, I just hooked up a music synthesizer to my computer, one of the very first MIDI connections. And Feynman got the hugest kick out of it, because I had a little sequencer, and I used it to play bongo sequences. And next thing I knew, Feynman had dragged me down to Caltech. And he and Carver Mead were sort of uh, persuasive, let's say. Uh, I was sorely tempted to go to Caltech. And then a week later, uh, Mark had turned up with Marvin. And we all went out for Chinese food. And I was sitting next to Marvin. Uh, we talked about movies. Of course, movies were my job. We talked about music and movies. Marvin was a big fan of John Williams. And after rattling through all sorts of John Williams anecdotes, we sort of slid effortlessly into conversation about late Beethoven quartets. And, and at some point, I got up the nerve to ask Marvin where he went for his PhD. And he said, Princeton. And I said, oh, who was your advisor? And he said, Tucker, Albert Tucker. I said, I didn't know that. He said, well, in fact, uh, he said, I probably did more work with John von Neumann. And so as, as I was picking my fork up off the floor, uh, he continued and said, yeah, and I, I worked summers at Bell Laboratories with Claude Shannon. And I thought, head exploding. I blurted out, hey, I worked at Bell Labs too. But it, it didn't have the same <laughs> resonance. And, and Marvin was saying something about a really exciting new laboratory at MIT. And, uh, and I wasn't listening because I'd already decided where I was going to go. Uh, and interestingly, MIT was the only place that I didn't visit. I went sight unseen uh, because of that lunch or dinner or whatever it was with Marvin. Um, I pointed my car across the country several months later. I had my little Honda Civic stuffed with all of my possessions. And I'm tootling across. I get to Iowa to a truck stop. I grab a phone, and I call Marvin. Uh, just to let him know that, yes, I am, in fact, coming a few more days since I'm in Iowa. And uh, Marvin says, do you have a place to stay? And I said, well, uh, I was just going to grab a hotel in Harvard Square and find an apartment. And he said, hang on for a second. And there's a little muffled noise. And he comes back. And he says, Gloria says, it's OK if you stay in our attic. Uh, and I said, oh, uh, all right. And so I arrived at 111 Ivy Street. and unloaded my life into Marvin and Gloria's attic as, as if it was normal, you know, as if it was just part of the deal. You go to MIT, and this is what you do. You move in with your advisor. They didn't have that <laughs> on the admission form. <clears throat> 
I hope that thought will think in, sink in with a lot of you because uh, that was the sort of relationship that Marvin had with everyone. I, I was very struck, as a lot of his students were, by the, the way that Marvin's kids called their dad Marvin. They didn't call him dad. Uh, and Marvin um, treated his children like they were his students, and his students like they were children. And it was, uh, I still have to pinch myself. It, <clears throat> Two more little anecdotes. Um, I guess one has to do with pollination, although that's not an adequate word. I had a meeting arranged with Marvin, uh, graduate student advisor kind of thing. I showed up at his office, and there's no one there, which was kind of normal. Uh, so to kill time, I grabbed a book off the shelf. And I'm flipping through the front of the book, and there's a very lovely inscription from the author of the book. And it says, Marvin, do you remember that time we attended a conference in Hawaii at Kona? We took a walk on the beach to get away from all the boring speakers. And it was swarming with mosquitoes. And we were swatting the bugs. And he said, you know, I bet there are mosquitoes that have, uh, have been frozen in amber that contain blood from extinct animals, like dinosaurs. And the author said, thanks for the idea. It worked out pretty well. It's Michael Crichton. And the, <laughs> this, uh, it, it, Gloria, if you're looking for the book, it was the second Jurassic Park novel, The Lost World. Um, it's there somewhere. You know, is that pollination? I don't know. But when you know a lot about a little, you drop these little pearls, and they ha tend to have more resonance and, and be more disruptive than, than the typical pearl that people drop. Um, <clears throat> the last uh, little anecdote has to do with expecting the unexpected. Early on, when I was up in the attic, you know, late August, early September, no air conditioning, third floor, very hot. Uh, I couldn't sleep. And I noticed there was a bunch of graffiti scribbled on the wall, little things, little jottings signed Arthur C. Clarke or uh, Danny Hillis or Claude Shannon, all the people who'd slept in the attic before me. Um, I, uh, I was hungry. And so I came downstairs to look for a midnight snack. And I opened the refrigerator, and it was full of stuff, just packed, all wrapped in brown butcher paper. Uh, and I opened up a packet, and it was sort of like meat, but there were sort of fingers in it, bones. And I thought, this is not for people. And I <laughs> lost my appetite in a second, thinking Frankensteinish thoughts. And I went into the living room and sat down in the couch. Not that couch. That's a later version. It was a wider couch. The webbing had failed. You sort of sink in and lose a lot of stuff in the couch. So something crunched underneath me. And, uh, and I pulled it up, and it was a draft of Marvin's Society of Mind. So I did what I often do with drafts. I skipped right to the end to see how this mind stuff all worked out and found the appendix. And the appendix was acknowledgments. Um, they were, um, <clears throat> first thing that struck me was they were so beautifully written. Uh, Marvin wrote like a poet when he wanted to. Uh, just wonderfully written acknowledgments. And the second thing that struck me was the long list of people that he thanked, just like Gloria said, all the students, all the secretaries, his advisor von Neumann, you know, his interactions with Shannon, all the names were there. It was breathtaking. And it, it was apparent right from that moment that Marvin really cherished ideas, and he cherished people who had ideas and, and brought them into reality. Um, when I talked to Marvin the next day, I said, what the hell's in your refrigerator? <laughs> And he said, oh, that's just seal blubber. And I said, oh, of course, you know, seal blubber. <laughs> Why do you have a refrigerator full of seal blubber? Uh, and Marvin said, well, Susan Butcher keeps winning the Iditarod sled dog race. She lives here in Brookline, and she's got a whole dog team. And, and she needed a place to, to keep yeah. her seal blubber. <laughs> of course, because if somebody sends you a truckload of seal blubber, you call Minsky. And, <laughs> And uh, you know, that all speaks to expecting the unexpected. Uh, I have that one last picture, if you could put up. I'll, I just wanted to say one thing about it. Um, that one. Um, the people are all wonderful. This was our last, uh, the last EG conference that Marvin was able to attend. He was always our lounge pianist. Uh, little Joey Alexander is 11 years old. He's the next Mozart or Chopin. Unbelievable prodigy. Uh, Michael Wright reconstructed the Antikythera mechanism. Go Google that up and blow your mind. Um, but the reason I put this picture in there is because um, <clears throat> I see I have my hand on Marvin's shoulder. 
And I just thought back to all the times that he put his hand on my shoulder when I was tapping on a computer or playing on a piano, and the way he touched so many of us. So thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Dylan Holmes. I'm a PhD student in artificial intelligence. And I first met Marvin when we started working together when I was his teaching assistant back in 2013. Uh, one of the things that really stood out about Marvin in his Society of Mind lectures was his muse-like character, because he would give these brilliant lectures scintillating with ideas that would make you think for months or years afterwards. But the amazing thing was, on top of all that, the way he would start his lectures because he would almost invariably start by saying, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> or I guess in his more characteristic way, does anyone have any good ideas? Or maybe bad ones would be better. <laughs> See, he was overflowing with ideas of his own, but he always cared what his students were thinking about, what problems they had, and what solutions they had found. And he had that knack of always misunderstanding a suggestion as an idea that was 10 times better than the one that you thought you were thinking of. <laughs> uh, for that reason, I always thought of Marvin as this muse-like character. So that was what lecture was like. Uh, behind the scenes, about an hour or two before each lecture, I would meet with Marvin. We met not in his office, but always in his living room that you see around you. Uh, that living room was a cultural focal point, has been mentioned before. There were all of these famous and intelligent and talented people from all around the world who had come to visit him. I saw famous mathematicians and musicians and science fiction writers, all of them. And then, of course, I had to go there and sit where they were sitting and talk to the man himself. Uh, needless to say, it was a little intimidating at first. But you know, Marvin would always listen to people, and he'd always listen to everyone in exactly the same way. Uh, I like to think that the fact that he had so many famous and talented people in his living room was a testament to his intellectual horsepower and to the quality of his ideas. And the fact that he had so many other people there, people like me, people he had just met in his living room, was a testament to his open-mindedness and to his egalitarian spirit. I learned from talking with him that he'd entertain any idea just to see what it had to say. And in the same way, he'd entertain any person just to hear what they had to say. So there we were in his living room. We had many conversations there. Uh, one of the ones that stands out in particular is the one we had before the uh, first day of Society of Mind. I said something like, uh, Marvin, I'm so excited. I can't wait to see what you have planned for this lecture. I can't believe it's 20 minutes before we're starting. What do you have planned? And he said, oh, good, 20 minutes. What do you want to do in class? <laughs> you know, he was always improvisational like that. He never liked planning anything. And he was so spontaneous, it was almost as if planning would spoil the surprise. He was the kind of person who would much rather push a button or hop a fence or open a door and then figure it out from there rather than plan it out in advance. And you know, I came to him in subsequent weeks with many suggestions for what we could do during lecture. I said we could have student panel discussions or debates, and he had suggestions of his own. Like, we could make all of the students into TAs and then they could teach each other. <laughs> And no matter what we came up with, and no matter what we decided, and no matter when we decided it, he would stroll into the lecture hall and knock it out of the park. I guess I found that inspiring because it was so fearless, because he cared much less about things going according to plan, and much more about seeing what you could do in the moment and what you were capable of. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the same attributes that made Marvin such a creative and original thinker were the attributes that made him into such a kind person and such a fun person to be around and to talk to. Um, see, he would, he would give these lectures that were muse-like, and he was overflowing with his own ideas. But he would also listen to his students and hear theirs. He would have all the most famous and talented and brilliant people in his living room but he'd invite anyone over just to hear what they had to say. And he was fearless and improvisational in lecture and in life. 
And so it's because of the many ways he changed the way that I think and because of the many ideas that still drive my research today, but also because of his warmth and compassion and generosity that he earned my respect and admiration. Um, I knew shortly after meeting Marvin that in so many senses of the phrase, I wanted to do what he did. I still do, and he still inspires me to this day and every day. I'm, I'm Danny Hillis. I'm another student of Marvin's. I, I also lived in the house for a while. In fact, I, I, I lived right under the floor there in the living room. I, I lived in the basement uh, for a long time, actually while Marvin was writing Society of Mind. And um, I'm, I'm going to say some things that, I, actually, first I, I have to tell a story about the house. Um, which is I went back there um, a, a couple of years ago and I had a little portable Geiger counter uh, that I thought Marvin would like to see and I brought it with me and I walked in the house. I was walking around the house and I walked down the stairway into the basement to see where I, uh, where I used to live and the Geiger counter went off. <laughs> and so I opened up a closet and the closet was full of chemicals and optics and lenses and things like that and so I was trying to figure out what was radioactive and I put everything on the floor and everything I moved out was not radioactive and eventually I had the closet empty and the Geiger counter was still going off and I, I saw this sort of a secret panel in the back of the closet. And I opened that up and there was a human skeleton. <laughs> and, and so I went upstairs and, and Gloria was there <laughs> and I was like, Gloria, I, 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 I don't know how to tell you this but there's a, there's a skeleton in your closet. And she's like, oh, that's where we put the skeleton. <laughs> so it was a wonderful house to live in. And it was wonderful, again, because of all, uh, this, uh, uh, the other speakers have mentioned this, but it was, a, it was such a center of people coming through to talk to Marvin because his intellect and his ability to talk on any subject and challenge people on any subjects. And it was, as, as, as Patrick Winston said, when, when you first met Marvin, it was, it was intimidating. Because Marvin's way of engaging with someone was whatever they said, he basically took the opposite point of view and told them how, you know, what, if they believed it very strongly, he explained, the stronger they believed it, the more he thought it was a stupid idea. And, and, and that was a scary thing to watch um, when, until you sort of got that this was his, his way of playing with people. It was his way of stretching people and so on. So we all kind of hung out and watched it for a while. And at, at the 30th anniversary, I told the story, uh, which I won't repeat, but basically about how I got to know Marvin by hanging out while he was building something until I finally found something that I could argue with him about. Um, you know, something that he actually made a mistake on and I could engage with him and then, you know, that was, and that was the way I got to know him and I, I hung out with him enough then so that eventually he assumed that I worked for him. And, um, and, and that process was one aspect of Marvin. And, and he was, and we've ta everybody's talked about his kind of playfulness and his sense of humor and so on. But, there's another side to him which has always forced you to go deeper to things. So if you were a student and you got into an argument, he would, he would loan you a book. And that was his kind of way of doing a reading assignment. So he would loan you a book on dimension theory or Tinbergen or Leibniz or something like that. And you were kind of got the message that, you know, hey, if you really want to have this argument, read this book first. And he encouraged his student to really learn his students to really learn mathematics and under, understand it. And he he really would take the trouble to teach them. I remember when I was a, a, a freshman, I went and there's this thing that all MIT students discover with wonder of the 
e to the pi i equals negative one. And it kind of looks magic. It's this magical formula that makes no, it seems to make no sense. And I remember going into Marvin's office and asking him about that. And he explained to me about complex planes and he gave this geometric explanation that made it made sense to me. And I said, oh, okay, well, I understand it. He says, no, you don't. That's just one way. You now understand it just one way. You don't understand something until you understand it more than one way. And then he started all over again and he explained it to me with Taylor series and summing Taylor series in a completely different way and spent, basically gave an hour lecture to me, a freshman, coming in with a, a question to get me to understand this idea from more than one, one side. And he had, that, he had that kind of depth that you know, was always pushed you to think harder. And that was the, the thing he did around him. And that was why all those people were coming to his house, because he made, them, he made them think and he made us all think. And he engaged with people in that kind of adversarial intellectual style. But he also had with him, he also was a very tender, kind person. And he took on this persona that sometimes he didn't like directly act that way. But I remember once when I was an undergraduate with him and his students and I, I started going through, I, I don't even remember what the problem was, but I had some difficult problem in my personal life. And um, Marvin was sort of aware of it, but we didn't talk about it directly. But I was obviously pretty sad about it. And he came and he, somewhere he found a, a uh, a concave lens, a biconcave lens. And he just came, came over to me and said, here, that's to make things look smaller. <laughs> and he touched, he, many times like that, he would, sorry. When, when we were doing the, the 30th anniversary, and I, I hope many of you were there. You got to see Marvin in, in full form. Um, there was one thing that struck me. There was a, there was a slide um, that got shown a couple of times. And do we, have, do we have the slide of Marvin in the Dartmouth conference? It was actually mentioned by Daniela earlier. But it was, it, it was, it was this slide of the founders of AI with Marvin there in the center, and you know, there are Claude Shannon's over there, John McCarthy, Oliver Selfridge, Nat Chester, Ray Solomonoff. So it's really amazing set of people. But what really what struck me when I saw that slide is that, you know, um, that Marvin made sure that his students met all of these people. And that they got to know them, and it's 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 what you know the kinds of people that that Mike Hawley was mentioning, and certainly not people that I would have normally met in life. In fact, if I look at the the people, but you know the scientists, the science fiction writers, the um, the musicians that you know I have been important to me and shaped me, almost all of them were introduced to me by Marvin. And he was, he was so generous in sort of bringing everybody together like that, no matter, again, it was that, that, that mixture of connecting people. And, he would, and the interesting thing is he would connect you to people he violently disagreed with on, on subjects. So for instance, um, I mean, Francis Crick and him had go back and forth about consciousness. And Marvin thought consciousness was one of these suitcase words that really didn't mean a lot. And Francis Crick thought it was something very precise that could be found in the brain. And the great thing about Marvin is he would, he would bring you into that discussion. And you would get to see these, these two people argue back and forth about it. And he, in that, so in that argument, he would form the ideas better. And so you got to see Marvin was also would argue with his own ideas. He would treat. His own idea, he would tear apart his own ideas in the, in the same way. And if you look at the history of the, of the field of AI, each generation of thought was kind of Marvin inspired. So Marvin started out making neural networks. He made the first snark neural network machine and training and 
made the kind of basic reinforcement algorithms that are in deep learning today. And then he looked at that and he said, well, you know, this has this limitations. He wrote you know, a book with Seymour Papert explaining why you would have to have multiple levels in order for it to do anything powerful. And, that, and you would have to have very large numbers of neurons. And at those days, you couldn't do that. And so he kind of went on to the next thing. But pretty much explain you know, the kinds of algorithms that today we use in, in deep learning. But then he went on and did the kind of work with, you know, the, the, you saw him ex explaining uh, Patrick Winston's ARCH program and you know, that generation of, of, of AI, that kind of symbolic reasoning, that became the dominant way of AI where it was a single sort of planning thing that was making decisions and had a single point of view. And that became the dominant thing. But then he challenged it himself with society of mind. And society of mind, I think, is the thing that is maybe the, really the most profound of Marvin's ideas. And I think we've, we've gotten used to thinking about it so much that it's worth stepping back and realizing how, how profound a thought that was. Because he took something that was so basic that we all understand and take for granted, like, I think, therefore, I am. You know, that's, how can you question that? And Marvin said, basically, well, who's the I? Is there really an I there? And he got this other view of what goes on inside the head that, that the I was just a kind of illusion. The I was a story that we tell ourselves. And so it's a little bit analogous to imagine someone from a foreign country might say, well, the United States wants to invade Iraq. Now, anybody that's part of the United States knows the United States doesn't want anything. It's what happens is kind of an emergent behavior of all the various forces of lots of people with different goals. The United States doesn't have a goal. The United States isn't happy or unhappy. But we tell a story about it as if it's an entity. In the same sense, we tell that kind of story about each other. So if we say this person has a goal or this person is happy or uh, that, uh, that person is irritated. We're really telling a kind of rough composite story. And actually, they're both happy and sad. They both have the goal and they have the opposite goal. But their emergent behavior is something that we need to simplify to tell a story about. So we have models of other people that are simplified. In that same sense, we make models of ourselves that are simplified. And so we have this model of ourselves that we want something, that we're happy, that we're, but we're really not. And that's what Marvin said, is that we're actually something much more complicated than that. That's a, that's a kind of a over simple story that we tell ourselves. And that way of thinking about things, I believe, will become the way that we start to think about ourselves. And it's completely different than the way that people used to think about the mind. And it also has in it something that I think is, is touched on in the program. I encourage you all to read that little draft from, from Marvin's essay. Because as soon as you start thinking about who we are as being this kind of society of ideas, you realize that not all those ideas necessarily have to live in the brain, in this, in this monkey. But some of those ideas can live out on a machine, extending our mind. Some of those ideas live in other people. And so the way we think, in fact, we think with other people. We think with our tools, with our machines. And so our mind becomes something bigger, and we become something bigger. And, and I, when Marvin wrote the piece in the menu about, about grief, he, he points out that when we, when we lose somebody, that we depend on to think that's part of, is part of our mind, it is part of how we think, then we're, then we're sad because we've lost a part of ourselves. And I think we all feel that way about Marvin. But thank you very much. Three little stories. One, we're all pushing our grief into shapes of joy, as Marvin indicated. Shakespeare taught us a long time ago, Marvin grasping that quality from Shakespeare and combining it to exactly what we're doing now. 
Uh, it's for the PhDs in the room to figure out exactly what some of the intersections are between Marvin's work and Einstein's work. But let me tell you something about Marvin's heart. He shares with Einstein's heart the aortic malfunction that killed Einstein. Einstein could have had surgery on his aorta, but chose not to, saying it would have been unnatural to live in a way that had been intervened upon by medicine. But Marvin had so much regard for his heart, and of course the technology was different and much better in his time than Einstein's time, that he chose to have a prosthetic uh, put into his heart, at which point he joyfully said that his heart had become a robot, uh, and it had kept him with us a few more years. We've got one more story to tell. Holly, I want you to get to the piano, all right, and think of something to play here, because this is going to be big. Um, Before or after the story? After the story. Okay. After, no, but sit down. Sit down. It's okay. piano. I, I love seeing you there. It makes the, it makes the room more real. <laughs> it, it, it makes it more actually real. Um, First of all, uh, a lot has been talked about how Marvin intimidated people as a, as a professor, even though he had such humanistic regard for people's feelings. Um, as a college dropout and as a daughter of, or as a father of two daughters, one of whom is an actress who loved Marvin but didn't really understand who he was in the grand scheme of things, uh, Marvin would always tell my daughter Olivia stories. He told the story about the contrails in the sky and how jet planes were the reason why uh, nature wanted to make pictures of bad clouds. And he said so many other things that amazed and dazzled Olivia. And she would come to me afterwards and say, I love that guy. Who, who is he? <laughs> is, he's a professor at MIT. I said, yeah, he's a professor of artificial intelligence. She thought about this. And, Days later, she came back to me, and Marvin's name came up at some point. She said, how can his intelligence be artificial? <laughs> There's no possible way. This is a story from the 1950s from Martin Schubick, the Princeton gang. Fine Hall, burblers, tinkerers, and gamesters, Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, Lloyd Shapley, John Nash, and many others, a perfect playpen and complete and competent support for all oblivious young egomaniacs. Possibly the item that distinguished Marvin from the rest is that although all were able to argue at length on almost anything and word patterns and symbol descriptions flowed without ceasing, he was the only seriously major league tinkerer among us. While some of us enjoyed devising games to stress the variety and perversity of human behavior, Marvin was less interested in overall social or antisocial games than in how one could build gadgets and programs to really do things, how you could make progress in understanding the subtleties of what appeared to be simple actions in everyday life, deconstructing them and then reconstructing them. From graduate school onwards, there was not enough time to look back. The hydra heads kept sprouting. Every problem solved opened new vistas. Some 65 years later, unto the day he died, Marvin had all of the enthusiasms and force that he had at the start of the journey. He was doubly blessed with the love and intellectual support of his wife, Gloria, as well as his children, snakes, gerbils, cats, jukebox, stacks, books, wiring, and tool collection that took up every inch of an ancient Brookline house of some 8,000 square feet, plus the occasional dismantled car to help decorate the garden. Michael. It's a tiny little musical invention. Marvin got a kick out of it, but sort of like the math problems that you can look at from different perspectives, this little piece does that too.
Cynthia, Brian. Do we get our slides? Try. Oh, there it is. Hi, I'm Brian Silverman, and this is Cynthia Solomon. Uh, we want to talk today about Marvin and Seymour, Marvin and Logo, Marvin and Education. Myself, I grew up in Montreal, which back in those days was a bit of an intellectual backwater, and my family had no connection at all with anything really academic or you know anything like no science or engineering. And people around me, when I was like getting to be of university age, said you should go to MIT you know, you're doing well in math and science. And I figured, OK, good, I'm going to go to MIT. So I applied, and I got in. And I get this acceptance letter, and I show it to my father. And he says, MIT, that's great. That's the school Marvin Minsky teaches at. <laughs> I said, Marvin who? And my father said, I don't know, but he's this guy that keeps appearing in all the science fiction that I read, so he probably is interesting. Uh, well. I got into um, No Marvin uh, a long time ago. And um, I wanted to learn to program. And a friend of mine said, uh, well, this guy I know is always looking for a secretary. So that's how I hooked up with Marvin. I wanted to learn to program, and I became his secretary. And you know, I did learn to program. And four years later, 1966, um, I was at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, where Seymour Papert, and I've just found out Danny Barbro, who's here, Wally Feuerzeig, me and another couple of people started a programming language for children called Logo. And the interesting thing, the reason I'm Talking about it is in the background was Marvin Minsky. Um, Marvin and Seymour collaborated on everything, including thinking about children learning things and what's a good environment. It's uh, probably worth saying uh, one word about Seymour at the beginning of this. Seymour, at that point, at the point just before Cynthia met him, was the resident mathematician at Piaget's lab. So he was kind of playing the role in an epistemology lab, trying to explain about mathematics. Marvin and Seymour famously gave the same talk at a conference and realized they should know each other. And with the help of, yeah, here you can have this. With the help of Warren McCullough, with the help of Warren McCullough, got lured to MIT, which. I kind of thought that there was a bit of an interesting symmetry to this, even though it wasn't in Marvin's intent. It turned out that um, Marvin had brought Seymour along. Marvin, the mathematician, had brought Seymour along to get some help with epistemology. <laughs> now, Logo is usually associated with Seymour. One of the things that we wanted to say today is, especially in the early days, Marvin's influence and his help in a lot of ways was very important. But this, um, in 1968-69, Seymour and I taught a class of seventh graders. And um, this is what it looked like. Those are Model 33s and Model 35 teletypes. Usually and used for printing out theses. What? <laughs> yes, that's why I'm mentioning it. That's what we used to the computer back at VBN. Um, after this project, I joined Seymour at MIT in the Logo Group as part of the AI group uh, started. And this is 1970. Um, and the reason this is when we had turtles, floor turtles, display turtles, music, animation, and it's only a year different. And one of the reasons it's so charged up is because of Marvin Minsky and the atmosphere at the AI lab. Because everybody, all the hackers and graduate students, almost all, participated. They loved Marvin. They loved Seymour. They had to be involved. And there was a lot of wonderful graphics that were done. Here is the music box that Marvin Minsky made. Does and if you look carefully, it's on the shelf just beside the, I'm not even It's worried. a black I, box. It's a black box. It sits on the Minsky's um, 
uh, fireplace mantle, but it's all sort of gutted. It it, this is Seymour summer. speaking. And this was this was a long time ago. Computer synthesized music was kind of not really in anybody's imagination. The music box fits in at about the time that um, Marvin and Ed Fredkin made the Muse. It fits a little bit after. Those of you who visited, the well, several earlier speakers talked about living in the Minsky house. There used to be a music synthesis machine in the kitchen, and we never really figured it out. It was rack mounted. It was rack mounted and quite impressive until somebody pulled half the wires out. And it was. Orange. And um, what we'd like to show next is. Um, um, let me interrupt. Okay. In 1972, um, we wanted to get Logo and Turtles out in the world. So Marvin Seymour, me, and a couple of other people started a company, oh, Seymour's brother, called General Turtle. And um, this is what happened. Marvin decided to build, and this is where Danny was talking, build a, a logo machine, a, graph, a turtle graphics machine. Here it is. This machine is called the 2500, and basically it's a small, very powerful computer which has built into it hardware to run two kinds of displays. This is the central processor, which is the computer itself. This is a display which shows printed material, and uh, it can use several kinds of fonts. In fact, you can design your own type font, and it can do a limited amount of picture display ability. This is called a vector scope, which can show pictures made of lines and curves and points, and show pictures that move quite rapidly and uh, any kind of animation that you can program. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Seymour Packard at MIT who developed the programming language that we use for this kind of animation. <coughs> that was Professor Marvin Minsky who designed and built this machine. I'm going to show you how simple it is to write some very some pictures in the language that we've developed for children and other people. So actually, this video is from the early 70s, and um, it was on a VHS tape in a storage container at the Minsky's that only- at Marvin, at, In Marvin's it was, storage bin. It, it, in Marvin's storage bin, and only recently got on Earth. But I, I find it particularly charming. It, it was 1975. Well, um, Seymour describes logo, but never says the word logo. And the computer that Marvin's describing did have a bug that Danny fixed, and he actually wrote some of the control software for that. And Danny wrote the best program that uh, was a Ferris wheel with rocking seats. Uh, but a point about this, which I think is really Marvin, um, Seymour needed a computer to do his research. You know, Marvin said, OK, Seymour needs a computer. I'll build a computer. And so at the, he just learned enough about using. The design of this kind of resembled some of the other work being done at the lab at the time. But it was essentially um, a lot of Marvin's tinkering. Is research required a particular thing? If that thing didn't exist, Marvin just invented it. Yes. Um, well, uh, the next thing that happened is we started another company. Um, that this one wasn't for us too successful because um, the little home computers came out and were in kind of competition. It, I have a piece that I cut out where Marvin says this was inexpensive. It was only five thousand dollars. <laughs> so anyway, um, here is Marvin talking about. Uh, well, the important idea was <clears throat> to let the child initiate activities because you want to find out what the, or you want to exhibit what the child already can do and then modify or build on it. And in the traditional curriculum, you assume the children are 
blank slates and and try to start from nothing. And so if anything conflicts with the skills they already have, uh, they have to subtract rather than add to their abilities. Um, the company we started, Brian was also one of the founders, and it was called Logo Computer Systems. And we were trying to get Logo. Brian became the major programmer. And uh, there were various wonderful versions. And Marvin and I backed off. But <laughs> in that video, one of the things is, uh, we watched it several times while we were preparing this talk. Marvin is saying some things that you could hear the roots in Piaget. But interestingly enough, the roots in Piaget is, it's not Piaget according to Piaget. It's Piaget according to Seymour. And yes, um, one of the things I, I talked to Brian about was when Marvin and Seymour first started collaborating, Marvin came from a Harvard tradition. He was an undergraduate at Harvard, and he worked with Skinner, and he was imbued with Skinnerian thinking. He built some apparatus, of course, for Skinner. Um, but he wasn't very happy. Uh, he wasn't satisfied at all with uh, Skinner's theory of learning. It wasn't, it, it didn't explain enough. It wasn't, it couldn't treat complicated things. And he was looking for a, no, a new foundation, and along came Seymour, who had been working with Piaget, but had his own interpretations of children and thinking. So in kind of wrapping up, what, my... Oh. Yeah, I know. So the next, oh, yeah, we're trying to keep to five. Yeah, we're going to uh, try to keep okay. to five. Okay. The next thing, the, um, from uh, the publication of his book, um, Society of Mind, uh, almost through um, working on a motion machine, Marvin backed off of thinking about children and computers. Also, his kids had grown up. and. His grandchildren were, you know, not around enough, maybe, or something. Anyway, he again hooked up because of uh, uh, working with one laptop per child. And he, this was his contract with one laptop per child. But what he did do is he wrote five papers on education, which are... Which are very Marvin and very good. So if you want to get a sense of Marvin and education, look up the OLPC papers. Yeah. So. That's it. That's it. So um, I just wanted to say, as so I started off by saying um, that my father said, I'm going to the university that Marvin Minsky teaches at. That's great. Turns out he was completely right. <laughs> <laughs> My story is titled Another Side of Marvin Minsky, but actually it's the same side as everyone else. So, OK. Mar Marvin's creativity and spirit accomplished many wonderful things beyond his, his well-known contributions to AI and science. He repeatedly invented creative ways of bypassing misguided efforts of bureaucrats. And his empathy for those in need of help prompted him to engineer and implement novel solutions to their personal problems. I was both a witness and a beneficiary of this. It was 1956, shortly after the Air Force assigned me to Lincoln Laboratory at MIT, or MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, when I first met Marvin Minsky and John McCarthy. Minsky and McCarthy became my two closest friends. When I left the Air Force and got a job in BB, at BBN in 1958, I convinced them to hire both Minsky and McCarthy as consultants. A few years after that, I started my own company, Information International, Inc., and Minsky, McCarthy, Oliver Selfridge, and I were the board of directors. In 1965, uh, Minsky, McCarthy, and I were at a meeting in Santa Monica, California, 
and John told Marvin and me that the MIT EE department had, in essence, told him to leave. Uh, it's a, one of the little tragedies of MIT that they didn't understand John McCarthy's uh, desire to have people interact with computers because people used to use computers by punching cards and waiting till the next day to find out what happened. Okay. So he'd arranged for an interview at Caltech. Marvin suggested that we drive John to Car Caltech to provide transportation for John and a bit of moral support. At Caltech, we waited till John emerged from his interview to tell us that, like MIT, Caltech wasn't interested. So John decided to try Stanford next and left for the airport. You all know what happened, and John had a fantastic career at Stanford. <clears throat> then, as we were stranded in Pasadena with nothing to do, Marvin suggested that we simply phone an interesting Caltech person who might invite us to their home to talk. <laughs> so I suggested Linus Pauling, whom I knew when I was a student there, but he was out of town. <laughs> then Marvin suggested Richard Feynman, who answered the phone and invited us to come over. We had a fantastic evening lasting past midnight. Feynman told us about his ideas on miniaturization, as in his paper, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he sort of predicted all of the microscopic technology that uh, uh, computers thrive on, OK? And he showed us a tiny electric motor that had won a prize that he'd offered for being able to fit into a cube 1 64th of an inch on edge. Marvin talked about AI and mentioned SIN, S-I-N, Jim Slagle's pioneering MIT doctorate thesis on symbolic integration. This piqued Feynman's interest, and he showed us about 50 pages covered with densely handwritten algebraic calculations. Feynman, Murray Gelman, and a graduate student had each done the same algebra, but their end results were mutually incompatible. They concluded that humans just couldn't do that much algebra without a high probability of errors. Feynman asked, could something like Slagle's approach be used to assist someone doing massive amounts of algebra? Marvin and I quickly imagined such an interactive system and outlined the possibilities to Feynman. On the flight back to Boston, Marvin sketched out what was eventually implemented as Maxima, MATLAB, Mathematica, and so on. Let me just say one thing. The ideas of a computer doing uh, algebra really started with John McCarthy and uh, with the programming language Lisp. And various people uh, had solved various problems. And the problem of integration was first solved by uh, Slagle. And later on, uh, other people, you know, like Joel Moses, improved upon it a great deal and made it much more capable. But what they didn't have in mind was the idea of a person being assisted in his doing algebra as opposed to the idea the computer can solve that problem. Okay? And that's what uh, uh, Feynman started us looking for. Okay. So, um, Bill Martin, a graduate student then, led the Maxima programming effort, but at one point he ran out of steam. Marvin called me and told me about the situation and suggested that Bill simply needed a break for a few months. He suggested that III, my company, hire Bill to come to Los Angeles and work there on a different task. After a few months of, of intense work at III, the same thing happened. Marvin then suggested that I now send Bill back to the AI lab. <laughs> I did, and Bill energetically plunged back into the task of leading the project to finish Maxima. At III, I discovered that Bill had actually completed like 99% of this whole difficult programming task uh, on his project, and it only took me a couple of days to finish that last 1% because the work was really done, and it was a great success, by the way. Over time, Marvin 
repeatedly asked me to hire one person after another as a beneficial interruption of their work at the AI lab. <laughs> we normally expected a return to the lab, grad students ready to complete a thesis or staff invigorated. One day, Bill Henneman, then a triple I programmer and self-taught mathematician, told me that he'd wanted to get a math degree from MIT. Yeah but that MIT insisted he could not apply for admission as an undergraduate until he had a high school diploma. <laughs> I brought the problem to Marvin, okay, who as usual came up with a brilliant solution. He quickly got Bill admitted as an MIT graduate student. <laughs> it had never occurred to the MIT graduate school to even think of asking an applicant whether or not they had a high school diploma. <laughs> Bill soon got his PhD at MIT, became a professor at BU, and was a key contributor to the creation of MATLAB, which is another one of these systems and a quite successful one. Okay. In 1968, Marvin and I worked together to create a triple I proposal to ARPA to develop and program uh, real-time components of a computer robotic system. In particular, a robotic arm connected to a computer and a video input device. That was quite a problem in those days because no computer had enough memory to take one frame of video. So we had to do something where you could tell it X, Y, and it told you what it looked like at that point. So it was, those days, memory was a dollar a byte. Okay. Instead of, now it's a dollar a gigabyte. Okay. okay, Marvin had slyly suggested to ARPA that MIT should do the project, and ARPA had agreed. When I found out, I felt excluded and was really annoyed. But Marvin had a bigger plan in, man, in mind. He also engineered keeping me involved by persuading the powers that be at MIT to appoint me with no degree at all as a visiting professor, which started me on an academic career. That's how I got to MIT. Years later, after spending a year at Caltech working with Feynman on physics, I told Marvin that I wanted to switch from computer science to physics. He put me in touch with his neighbor, uh, just around the corner from Marvin's house, Larry Sulak, who was the head of physics at BU. I don't know what Marvin told Larry, but when I contacted him, he simply told me to get him some letters of recommendation, and in three weeks, three weeks later, I was appointed a professor of physics at BU. So Marvin works magic in various directions. My first glimpse of that wonderfully human aspect of Marvin's creativity occurred a half a century ago when he told me that Henry, his four-year-old son at that time, didn't have a good friend. Since my son Michael was about the same age, Marvin described various interactions we could both engineer despite the fact that our homes were quite far apart. Uh, he, uh, I lived in Natick at that time and Marvin lived in Brookline, so that they might become good friends. We did as Marvin suggested, and half a century later, they're still good friends. Okay. That's it. Hello, I'm Tom Ashbrook with NPR and WBUR. If it's upsetting to have two radio guys on the stage materialized, please just close your eyes. <laughs> um, in 1981, uh, with my young bride, I was, uh, had returned from four or five years in China and, and India. And uh, one of my dearest, oldest friends, David Levitt, uh, was working on his doctorate here in AI at MIT with uh, Marvin. Um, we came from the Midwest in a U-Haul and uh, drove 1,000 plus miles here. We were going to stay at David's house. I studied briefly uh, math and physics at MIT when I drove that U-Haul 98 under the 96 bridge uh, under press, underpass on Mass Avenue. Um, I'm going to introduce a video from David, who's in California and couldn't make it in about 30 seconds because we are time traveling here, as you may have noticed. Uh, I only wanted to say that the first, I didn't know anything about Boston except 
Paul Revere stories. And the first social event that I remember in the city was with David. We were staying in his graduate, you know, dilapidated housing back here, graduate student thing. And he said, there's a party at Marvin Minsky's. Let, let's go. Margaret's having it. And we went. And I didn't know anything about this city. And I'm not a scientist. And we, and we came into this, this room. And, and in this room, there was rock and music going on. And we were ready to dance. But we came into the room, and it wasn't an, a dance like I'd ever seen. Um, it was a kind of, uh, there were lots of people. Maybe all of you were there. I don't know how. And it, everybody was like doing some mechanical motion, and they all fit together. There must have been 30 people, and it was like a big like society of mind orgy going on. And you couldn't just do the funky chicken. You know, You had to figure out how to get into this machine physically. And that was my introduction to Boston. Uh, it was some people are foundational to understanding a place. I believe Marvin Minsky was foundational to understanding Boston. And in all the decades I've lived in and around Boston since that evening, thank you, Margaret and Gloria and Marvin, uh, was absolutely fundamental to my sense of the power and beauty of, th of thought and, and the mind and the society of mind. And this is my friend, David Levitt, who's now in California. And he just wanted to say he studied AI. He got his doctorate here with Marvin. Um, he's a scientist, inventor, musician. I feel like I'm at the Oscars because I know how, what the clock is doing here. Um, he, he met Marvin in 1978. They began working on software that simulates how people improvise jazz, what goes through a musician's mind when he's asked to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star in the style of Fats Waller, let's say. Uh, D David is now. Uh, Working, uh, he's CEO of Pantomime Corporation. Uh, it's virtual reality. You know, Marvin student Ivan Sutherland, of course, got that going, and David's got great things going at, at, at Pantomime. And uh, he, he then and now, his love for Marvin, well, you'll see it. It's an honor to be celebrating with you the life of Marvin Minsky, the, the smartest, most curious, most generous, most honest person I've ever known, most influential, and even more so the most kind and generous person. You realize, how does the smartest person in the world or in the room not intimidate everybody? And the answer is, he, he, he had such a gift for humor that uh, a student could never feel like he had asked a foolish question. The student asked, uh, is there a, could there be a, a genetic basis rather than environment, a genetic basis to differences in intelligence? Marvin says, well, if there wasn't, then some lettuce would be as smart as people. <laughs> he had books lying on every surface. I don't know if Tom has already described Marvin's living room. It, there's too much to describe and just one glimpse of Marvin's living room. For a while, he had books on every surface, and many of them had written in marker on the edge, read important instruction. And the biggest one had that marking to it was the Oxford English Dictionary. Read. And, and, and he knew a lot of, he, he, knew, he knew principles of language, more, even more so than words. I, I asked him uh, if a certain word that I knew was a noun could also be a verb. Marvin said confidently, you can verb anything. Who but Marvin could not only answer a more general question than the one you asked correctly, and include an example and say it in only four words. It's pure Marvin. And something like that would come out of him every three minutes. And it was like, it was like being with a great comedian. It was like having tickets to the funniest guy. Uh, every, it, when, when he moved from the AI lab to the media lab, we, we knew, I mean, we knew the media lab was going to be exciting, but now we knew it was going to be the most exciting place. If someone was trying to describe something complicated uh, in uh, psychology or politics and yeah. said um, both sides do, or neither side or either side, Marvin would say, ah, a dumbbell theory. And he'd do it in the kindest way, never, 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 never insulting him. He actually would draw a barbell and say, oh, you've got an interesting theory that's got the problem broken up into two equal, roughly equal parts, and nothing much in between. That's actually the second simplest theory that you can have. 
uh, the, the, the simplest theory you could have just has one part and one answer. God did it. Uh, but you can do better. And what you realize is that when you say both sides, you've signaled your brain to stop thinking. It's your way of telling the person you're talking to and yourself, there's no need to think any more deeply about this. And I think the past 38 years of my life, any time that someone has said both sides, either side, neither side, a part of my brain has woken up and said, that's not, that, that dumbbell theory probably isn't the best description or the last description we need to make of that situation and that problem. And I think for hundreds and thousands of people who've been around Marvin, we've all become smarter by following the principles that Marvin taught us. And we've all become funnier and better improvisers. Marvin, Marvin was the most amazing improviser, not just at the keyboard where he'd improvise a few, but in the lecture hall where he would, he would carefully not make complete notes or any notes for a lecture. And the first lecture I saw Marvin give, he seemed to wander and was, had, had, was talking about evolution and child, children's learning. And he, by the end of it, he had drawn a tree, uh, a palm tree. And, and he wound up saying, I'm up, up at the top of this tree. And if you're not having as much fun as I am, you might as well consider changing fields. Because it, he created the most exciting mental playground out of the universe that <laughs> that any of us has ever seen. We never wanted to leave it. We haven't left it. It's still here. The fields that his students like Sutherland who created uh, computer graphics and simulation and what the field that I'm in now known as virtual reality, that whole universe that Marvin created is still here and it's glorious and he's immortal and he will never leave us. And thank, thank you. <laughs> I f <laughs> thank you, Marvin. Thanks to everyone who had Marvin in our lives. Thank you, Gloria, for making that amazing home the home to so many of, of us students. Thank you. I think of immortality in terms of, uh, for myself, it's the Society of Scientists because I feel that I'm doing a little of what Piaget wanted and a lot of what McCulloch wanted to do. And uh, there's some of Carol Williams in me and some of Andy Gleason. And I have two students who I think are inheriting McCulloch. They've never met McCulloch, but uh, through me, they're. So there's this big network of ideas, and it keeps growing as long Is as there science some grows. There's Watson Crick in you, too? There's a little Crick. Uh, there's a little Crick. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So my name is Ed Boyden. I direct a neurotechnology group here at the Media Lab. And I uh, just want to talk maybe through three very short stories about Marvin and how I think he's played a big role in brain science, which is sort of the, you know, the distant twin of all the AI we've been talking about. So of course, Marvin had his origins in brain science, doing a PhD on trying to make neural models and um, afterwards developing uh, a microscope, which to this very day, if you wander through any neuroscience department, you'll find several of them. Um, one of the most powerful tools still available in brain science. Uh, I was an undergraduate uh, studying physics at the Media Lab um, and doing some research here. And a couple of us students got the idea to invite Marvin and also Jerry Letfin, the neurophysiologist, to have a little bit of a debate. Um, and what really struck out was just how generous Marvin was with his time. Here he was, we were probably asking him questions that he was quite bored with, answering the 5,000th time. I'm joking, nothing would ever bore Marvin. Um, and yet there we were, going late into the night, discussing whether the brain was solvable and how you'd go about it. And uh, the interaction that began that day, um, I very much treasured over uh, the past decades. Uh, when I got to MIT later as faculty, um, I had many interactions with Marvin as well. And he always would, um, in his own powerful, sometimes blunt, uh, as you've heard already, but always generous and, and empathetic way, uh, would, would share his, his thoughts. And I still remember one small group setting where a couple of us were chatting about um, uh, some interesting uh, developments in AI and neuroscience, and I thought I had something helpful to say. And um, Marvin says something to the effect, uh, well, I really like Ed as a person, but do I have to listen to, talk, listen to him talk about neuroscience? And, <laughs> but in that, you know, the way that sort of d just described how much he balanced sort of the awe of the mind, and also let's stay on task. The mission is to understand intelligence at its very core. Don't settle for less. 
One last sort of series of thoughts is, you know, throughout all these years, it's always been, uh, it, it always has been amazing to just interact with Marvin about anything that came to his mind. And I remember at countless lunches or dinners or other events, he would come up and just start talking about something like, uh, do you think more life has been spent, you know, watching sports versus all the life lost in war? And I'm like, whoa, that's, <laughs> and, uh, and we get into a discussion about it. Or um, another example was when he decided that, um, you know, we would solve all of humanity's problems if humans could be engineered to be eight inches tall. And uh, I never asked him why eight, why not nine, why not seven, but he had all sorts of, of very, uh, you know, thoughtful ideas about energy and, you know, you could solve a lot of problems if we just were a little bit, a lot smaller. <laughs> and uh, so that's, I think that's what struck me, uh, struck me most about Marvin was just how almost anything could be a source of inspiration. And that's uh, what I really regard Marvin as, as having played a role in, in my own life as being very inspiring for getting a, a, a physicist trying to figure out a path in life and to confront one of the biggest challenges of all time, the mind. So thank you. Ruth. Ruth. Ruth Minsky, Amster, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, sit down. You know, I feel like this is the part of the program where you want to ask, you know, did Marvin ever have the reputation of like not picking up the check or, you know, just so, I mean, we've heard all these stories of generosity and, and just incredible yes. kindness and um, is there anything in there at all? The meanness, cruelty to animals, and nothing? Sorry. Zero. Zero. No, Absolutely no, not. No, nothing. So didn't get the record straight. So what was it like to grow up with, I mean, you go, you go way back. I go way back. And in the horse picture, you are on the horse? Uh, I'm on the horse. You're on the horse. So you're on the horse. Marvin is behind you, right? Right. Probably keeping me. Afloat. Keep you afloat. You don't know the picture. Yeah, maybe, maybe they'll, they'll put it up when when they find it. But but and then because I, I just I saw that picture and it's just so amazing. And then your sister Charlotte is standing next to you. Right. Where was that? That was in Florida. I uh, I I think my I was uh, I guess about a year old, maybe not quite. And uh, the nurse that was taking care of me had uh, it turned out to have tuberculosis. So my mother panicked and she took the whole family to Florida for six months or whatever. And uh, with the, which was the uh, what they thought was a healing procedure. I never showed a sign of anything in all the tests, but we that was that was the escape. People don't view Florida as necessarily that healing. They thought the sunlight pilgrimage you know, quite well, the same no, way no, anymore. No, no, but, right, uh, yeah. right, right, right. But uh, that was that was. Um, I was, it's nice to see the picture because you know how terrified I was most of the, most of my childhood. Uh, no, Marvin. Um, Everything that is said about him uh, uh, as a, a, a generous and a, a kind uh, a professor and thinker and um, brilliant mind was absolutely true from, from childhood. I guess we were about four and a half years apart. And so from my earliest memory was that he was the smartest person in the world. And I have no idea now where I got that idea. Um, homework helper? Someone must have told me. Homework helper? Did he... Homework helper? Help you with homework? No, no. Um, uh, he did teach me algebra in, well, you know, in that, elementary school. And he did, he did, uh, I did survive um, regents exams after being failing. Half, and we both, I went to Bronx Science after him. And uh, I didn't, I didn't know that you didn't have to read the books that or study, I thought that, you know, you, uh, he was my model. Oh, and so he never read it. I, I never saw him, you know, he looked at the book and that was it and he memorized it and <laughs> I didn't realize yeah. that, that, that a normal, you know, somebody of normal intelligence uh, might have to study. So, uh, so he had to sometimes rescue me by teaching me things and uh, I think I was, uh, I was, you know, I was an okay student, not, not great but I got along with my uh, meager uh, study skills. Uh, the, the most interesting thing was that one semester I was totally failing, I think, trigonometry. And um, I don't know, you know, I don't know why, but I called him up. I said, I've got a Regents exam coming up in a day or two. Uh, what could, he was at Princeton, I think, at that point. I said, what am I supposed to do? And he said, I, you know, well, let's, we talked about it a little bit. And he said, it's too late for you to, um, to learn the subject. 
but I'll tell you what to do. You just have to sit down with the, what I think it was the formulas. You have to memorize, you have to remember, learn overnight to, for, to derive all of the formulas because it's too late actually for you to understand anything else. And I got 98 or something. Oh my God. <laughs> I had a 17 average or something for the semester. And so he was an incredibly good teacher. And um, uh, it, was, it was a joy. I, I, was, I, I heard all of these stories about his um, creativity. What I was originally going to say is that he taught me from very, very early age. I, I was going to talk about his teaching me. He taught me what gravity was by dropping me down the laundry chute in our house. Oh. <laughs> well. but, but now. See, I figured there was some of this in the, yeah. Right, but now I think maybe he was actually experimenting. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, as I was hearing people talk about it, I thought, well, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe You he felt just, gravity waves, probably. Uh, maybe he wanted to know about gravity, and he wanted to be sure that if he dropped me down this hole, I would go to the bottom. <laughs> so, but I don't know, it, one way or the other, he, he was a teacher and he dragged me out. This is before I was three, because we lived in this house uh, only until I was three years old, and uh, the, where he taught me about gravity. And then he, I remembered, I never, of, of course, wait a minute, preface that. I, memories, we don't know what's a memory and what I remember remembering. You know, I'm not sure about any, the accuracy. But I do vividly remember being out on the patio in the horrendous thunderstorm so that he wanted me to understand that that beam, that, that light coming down was electricity. That, that was, and I just remember, I never forgot that, that lightning was electricity. And uh, but let's see, what are some of the other, that was all, I wanted to give you some examples of his teaching. Um, uh, he taught me about electricity by wiring the door of his lab where he was working and I didn't knock, so I grabbed the doorknob and got thrown across the room and I <laughs> learned to knock. So, so I didn't, again, I thought he was <laughs> teaching me. Right. But I think teaching maybe, you, yes, maybe he right. was trying to learn what would happen if you connected a diathermy machine to a doorknob. And, and there's some human behavior you know, in there, you know, so all he, kinds of stuff you learn. But he was, you know, and he was enormously funny. and I. I and, and, and I learned everything, almost everything I learned, I learned from him because I didn't read the study the books. Um, uh, he, um, whatever, uh, <laughs> what was that? I was going to, I wanted to tell you how, what a kind and wonderful brother he was. I mean, it was never. Uh, yeah, well, right. He it was still, the laundry chute. Well, it was and, hazardous. Yeah. I mean, he taught yeah. me to swim by throwing yeah. me in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, right. And, right. Yeah. and, uh, and then <laughs> but, I mean, brothers and sisters, that's such an, an amazing relationship, particularly an older brother and a younger sister. And, you know, as you, you know, aside from the scientific experiments involving laundry chutes and, and, and uh, electric, electrified doorknobs, um, how did, and, and the math quizzing stuff that, of course, he, was really easy for him and, and grand for you to get all that help, just as a, as a brother, as a supportive older brother, what was he like? Well, it, well there, were, there, were, there were two incidents that we, um, not incidents, but there were two summers when my parents were away. And um, they, they traveled and we, the three of us were home. There was seven years between us. And uh, I guess I must have been about in my middle teens. So the three of us, uh, Marvin had wonderful friends, right? He was always the same person. I mean, if you, interesting people, he only wanted to find interesting people. And we partied those summers, and the three of us were kind of a, became a clique. And we went everywhere together, and we, 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 we it, it became um, an, an incredible uh, bonding experience, which stayed with us the rest of our lives. We never, we were really very devoted. The kind of thing that he he did, he taught me to drive. I mean, as a, in terms of um, of brotherly things, uh, when when I got my my driver's license, he took me out, um, uh, and I 
uh, got somebody cut me off, and I sort of had to break quickly. And I think we maybe scraped something. There was no damage, but nothing happened. And I said, "Well, it wasn't my fault." And Marvin said, with Marvin's typical thing, "It wasn't your fault. But if I had been driving, it would not have happened." <laughs> and that was a learning. That was something which I never forgot. That was one of the kind of things that he would say to people that. Uh, and something based on the information that we've discussed here today is possibly not even true. <laughs> if he had been driving, I see. it might but, have been much worse. But, but he was, oh, of course he couldn't see. You know, <laughs> um, one of the, the kind of thing he did is I, I just was going to the senior prom of, of high school, and he was already out of ready in graduate school. And he was home, and my friend, my best friend, didn't have a date. And uh, he kindly took us together to the prom. Oh my Very god. Are, is there video of Marvin <laughs> at your senior prom? No, no, of course not. No, no, no. But I, and I think he must have driven us to the prom dance in his Rolls Royce that, that, that he had picked up and, and <laughs> as a Harvard undergraduate. <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's a story. Oh, yeah. He, they found a, he found a Rolls Royce and bought it for $300 or something. Oh my God. Drove it for a couple of years, and <laughs> so it was great fun. He, uh, he takes you to the prom in the Rolls Royce. Yes, yes. <laughs> that he got for 300 bucks, <laughs> And he's the oldest person at this prom, right? Probably. Um, probably. But he looks very young. Yeah, of course. He's very, he's very handsome. Uh, he's very, very uh, nice. Looking, I, very I mean, kind. And did he dance? I don't remember whether he danced at the prom. I know that with our parents took us um, often. My father, if he could get away on a weekend, we would go to the Catskills. Uh, and um, Marvin would occasionally dance with me so that I didn't have to refuse dancing with strange, <laughs> well, strange boys. <laughs> yes. So I pretended he was my date. And so we know that he. So he supported me. He yes. he protected me. He was he was um, he he saved my life in uh, Mississippi because I um, we were we traveled to uh, Mexico. The family it was one the one real big family trip, and um, uh, we I was about I guess sixteen I think, and uh, long blonde hair, long blonde hair. And um, I got on a bus and for some reason we were on a bus in Mississippi and I wanted to go sit in the back because um, I always sat in the back of the bus when I traveled home in the city. But you couldn't do that in Mississippi. It wasn't allowed. White people couldn't sit in the back of the bus. And uh, I was so angry that I was restricted. That he really he physically had to de hold me back, and physically restrained me by probably, I don't know, grabbing my hair or something. But he was afraid I would get lynched. And uh, so that was a. An interesting learning experience traveling in the South in the in You were in the, the, the reverse image yeah. of the civil rights movement. I, well, I, I, I be, yeah, it, it changed. I mean, I was so, you know, so shocked at what was happening in the South that I, that it was, it was, um, it was a, like a permanent um, inoculation. Uh, so, and we, uh, oh. No, I, I, that's the, the, the other learning incident. We were traveling on that same trip on a DC-6, I believe, and it was pre-jet. And he, he's, we're, we're all on the plane, and he calls and says, Ruth, come, you've got to come out and look, at the wind, look out the window. And he said, see that big black cumulonimbus cloud? We're about to go into it. There was no navigating around them at that point. And he said, don't worry, but the plane's going to fall down. <laughs> and did it? Yeah. So it took me many years to, to, uh, to get over my phobia of flying after that. <laughs> but uh, but well, it was, it was, everything was learning. Everything that he did was to, to understand and knew. And, and he everything knew everything. Memorable. I mean, he knew, he knew all about weather. He knew, you know, he knew climate change. And it, was, uh, it was an adventure. Uh, just every day it was an adventure with Marvin. Well, and, thanks uh, for sharing and that I adventure. Miss, and uh, I miss him. Oh, and uh, of course, it was wonderful. Do. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oops, wait a minute. <laughs> thank, you. Okay, thank you. Margaret Minsky, ladies and gentlemen.
My dad and I were going to see the launch of Apollo 17. We were on a cruise with a bunch of scientists and science fiction writers. Uh, Carl Sagan was there, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, Frank Drake, Fred Pohl, Ted Sturgeon. And my dad was walking around on the regular deck of the ship and looked up and noticed the bridge deck. Up there, it was really tall. And Norman Mailer or someone was droning on about the implications of space travel. Program, you see, I think there are ways. I think that they are hardly recognized. And I think there's a huge achievement for NASA to recognize it, is that they, they have performed this technological miracle. And they are not going to be rewarded for it in, in the uh, spiritual sense. They are not beloved, esteemed, and honored. They're, they're just... I remember that as though it were yesterday. Now let's go to the Boston Kite Festival here in Boston, Franklin Park. Marvin was always lithe and agile in body and also really dexterous. And he won the prize at the Boston Kite Festival that year for the largest kite and for the smallest kite. Here he's handling the largest kite, which is full body work. And the smallest kite um, is handwork. It was a little piece of gold leaf that he made. So about this, about that big, about a quarter inch. And he made a string for it by taking a tiny globe of melted plastic. It's probably nylon because um, he used to melt nylon blobs to end the ropes for his belts. But for the kite, he melted a little blob of nylon and then he drew it out uh, to make a really, really tiny thread. And he attached that to the kite, or actually maybe he um, attached the blob to the kite first and drew it so it stayed stuck. And uh, he flew that as the smallest kite. And it won the award. Um, you had to run with it to make it stay up. And actually it's the same with this biggest kite. that <laughs> You had to run with it to make it stay up in the air. And when I was a kid, sometimes he'd say, I think I need to run around the block. And then he'd run uh, really, really fast, uh, like, like super fast around the block, all the way around the block. And, and then, OK, that's done. A <laughs> uh, part of himself. His way of being was how he used his hands himself, his gestures, his voice, and expressive face. And I now wonder if that sense that we all have of being told the right thing at the right time by him whether he created that right time in us through that expressiveness. Uh, he was the most psychologically well-adjusted person I know. And he himself said uh, he didn't, he felt he didn't think so great. Um, it's just that he was uncluttered. And uh, you know, uh, we're all neurotic or uh, whatever. <laughs> um, that unclutteredness I think it comes from that well-adjustedness, and it means that he had an enormous emotional range. Uh, and that meant that he could have that verve and empathy and beauty and never worry about it and never had to tone it down. And that let him do those things he loved, learn how another person thinks, uh, leap from rock to rock, make music, make decisions about what to build and who to hire, attract the best and, and make them the best. Uh, that emotional range means he could listen to music and not be the least bit daunted 
by the things that had the most range and the most creativity and unusual beauty, like Beethoven. And then, yeah, uh, he had the mind that could keep up with that, too. It means he could love disappointment and frustration and being wrong uh, as much as success and ease and being right. And that range could show on his face and hands and in his carriage. And it showed in his interaction with nature and with children and other people, as he called us, <laughs> and enthrall us. Um, he said that he always had to do something to keep his hands busy. That was a thing he said. And uh, for decades, uh, one of those things was making hand-eye robots that you've heard about. And that, in turn, meant making a great machine shop uh, filled with the kind of people who made things, the kind of people he liked to hang out with, like uh, Tom Callahan and Freddie Drenkin, who I think is here. Oh, now, why do that? Uh, over the years, he gave many explanations. Uh, and one was that uh, he didn't uh, do, actually do robotics because it was needed for AI at all. Uh, it was because it would revolutionize the world and make everything safer, and also nobody else had figured out how to do it well. The real explanation is uh, he just felt it had to be done. And part of that was probably the sheer joy of physical making and perhaps of giving that part of physicality, of himself, the hand and the eye to the beings he was creating. That way of thinking, creating physical environments, it's what made him a great administrator. Uh, his floor of Tech Square, the old days AI lab building, across the street and over there, had ordinary offices for grad students that were crammed into the middle of the building, and they didn't even have windows. And he, uh, in 1970, he asked some young architecture students, which he probably got from uh, Nicholas, I don't know, uh, and he said, make the middle of my lab into a common room, a playroom. And these students did. And a few years later, an interviewer asked if they could come visit to um, soak up some atmosphere in the lab. And he said, yes, come. Uh, we have this big space in the middle with an orange rug. And here's where it gets physical again. You come and lie down on it. And they just jabber at you. <laughs> uh, this, um, I'm going to call it PQ, this physical quotient. Uh, let him bring the great spaces that he loved, the mountains, the ocean, to me. And he was, I, by virtue of that full connection, a speaker to animals, to children and other people, and to me. Um, but he was never sentimental about it. And he would have loved a different body, like a better one, or one with more arms, <laughs> or something about it to figure out. And I'm sure he would have made it work with elegance and shine with beauty and embrace us all the same. Thanks, John. Boy, how can you how can you follow that? Um, my name's Todd Macover and uh, I've been at the Media Lab for quite a while. 
uh, working on music. And um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of Marvin and music. Um, the main reason I've been at the Media Lab, was attracted here and have been here all this time, was, was to be around Marvin. Because we're all lucky that uh, Marvin spent his life in music, loving music. And um, I think he was one of the greatest musicians and musical thinkers of our time. And I think that's not been understood and acknowledged. And in, in preparing these few thoughts for today, Margaret was kind enough to find all kinds of recordings that Marvin made over the years, recordings of improvisations, recordings of compositions, recordings of thoughts. And the amount of material, I, I knew a lot about Marvin's work, but I had no idea how much he created in music. And um, I can only give you a tiny, tiny uh, idea of it today. But he spent his whole life in music. And um, as I was uh, finding out some of the ways he started, I think it was Ruth who told me a story of how Marvin may have gotten started in music. Apparently his dad was a very good pianist. And um, apparently he used to come home from work at the end of the day, his father. And um, first thing he would do, he'd come in, I guess, not even say anything to anybody, and he'd go and play Bach on the piano, apparently quite well. And then he'd go off, maybe to his home office or to relax after work. And when Marvin was about two or three years old, he'd listen to his father do that. And then he couldn't reach the keys, but he'd, he'd remember what his father did, and he'd try to put his fingers in the same place on the same keys that his father played to understand the music, but maybe also to speak to his father that way. And so Marvin's love of music is very, very deep uh, for reasons that are probably incredibly rich. And I think it's the place where his thinking about the mind and his thinking about feeling and how they're connected and how they're complex really interfaced. Um, he spent his whole life at the keyboard. Everybody's talked about that. Um, he never found a keyboard he didn't like, you know, he, he, that kind of keyboard. Um, he always had the newest keyboard uh, in the house. He always was trying those out. Um, he liked the oldest keyboard, didn't matter. Um, whenever there was a keyboard, he would play it. And what was incredibly remarkable is that he really improvised fantastically well, and he was very conscious of his improvisation, which is extremely rare. So he could play, he could think about where to go, and he could talk about it, which I've, I know a lot of musicians, and I've never seen that before. So here's a little clip of Marvin just playing a little bit and uh, talking about what he's doing. I don't know. If I try to remember something, then, then there's a strain between knowing what to do next and guessing what to do next. And things are always breaking. Try to be chromatic. I do stupid things, and because if you have to pay attention to the to one line, then you might not remember what you're doing in the others. There's always the circle of fifths for that. Now there's no way to do the F sharp. Could listen to that all day. The way Marvin thought about music was like nobody else. Everybody today has talked about how everything Marvin thought about was original. Music's weird because we all experience it, we all spend time with it, but you look at music books, and they're all so conventional. They all talk the same way. They talk about the harmonies and the chords and you know, the form. And it's all as if music is a given. Marvin's one of the few people, maybe the only people, or the only person I really knew who said, why do we have music at all? Why is it in our society? Why do we care about it? How does it work? How do we think about it? 
It doesn't matter, the chords are, 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 are superficial. So um, Marvin thought and wrote about music in a very, very profound way. This was at uh, IRCOM in Paris in the early 80s when we invited Marvin over to speak about music. And it was incredibly controversial. He came and talked about his ideas about uh, how music worked and room much bigger than this filled with the most famous musicians in the world. And they were very upset that Marvin, they really, that Marvin was trying to explain how they composed and how they listened because nobody really had tried to do that before. And of course it turns out now 20, 30, 40 years later that Marvin was right and they were all wrong. He was talking at that time about mind spiders which were um, the part of your mind that formed to pull all the other agents, the, all, the, all the experts in your mind together. And um, this was, uh, Marvin used to say that music was probably the activity that used more parts of our mind than any others. And that maybe music existed to allow parts of our minds to talk to each other. And I remember when he gave that talk about mind spiders, he came over to our house that evening and uh, we asked him to write, we had a little guest book. We asked him to write in the guest book. And um, so what did he write? He drew a bunch of mind spiders in our, in our uh, that's, a, that's a, I just found that the other day. Um, and during that time, he wrote a lot about music. I found a couple of interviews he'd written, um, but he wrote an article called Music, Mind, and Meaning, which I think is the most important article about how music works, probably written in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, Margaret and others uh, have a website called musicmindandmeaning.org where the article is, uh, you can find it, you can find a lot of video of Marvin, and um, it's really, really important. You should absolutely read it. Uh, because of this writing and because of this playing, um, Marvin influenced an unbelievable amount of people, really important people, students from here, a lot of people in this room, um, so many incredible people, uh, a lot of people in this room who are influenced by Marvin, uh, I didn't even get on the list because I couldn't fill it up, but you see it's composers and thinkers and psychologists and uh, scientists of all kinds. Uh, because Marvin was the only person saying, uh, what could music do? Could music be a way of, our, of rehearsing our emotions? Could it be a way of learning how to think without having any bad consequences? Um, and uh, over and over again, uh, new ways of thinking about music. It was inspiring. Uh, we made something called the Brain Opera with a lot of people from the Media Lab, which was actually our idea of what it would be like to walk through Marvin's mind when he was, when he was listening to music. <laughs> and um, one of the best things about that project is that we got to interview Marvin about music and what it meant. So I thought I'd just end with a few clips because there are many of these, they're priceless. Um, but here's just a little bit of Marvin attempting to connect music, not to other music, but to things that are important in our life. So uh, I love this one. It's very compelling. When a baby cries, it's very hard to stand there and not go and help it. Is that what's happening in most music? Is the music making you insist on doing something about something, except it's different from words because you don't know what the something is and you don't know what the something you're supposed to do is. So music is like the, the top level of a story. It has the structure of the story and it shows that in some sense you could have these things without having the characters and without having anything definite. And this is a totally original idea and it's important because it means that music is something that allows us to fill in those characters and us to make that story. It involves us in a way that maybe no other art form does. Um, every idea had, had really big implications. This next one is just something about does music have to exist the way we think about it? Does, does performance of music, listening to music have to be the way we always assume it, it was? Uh, why do we like music? Why do you like music? Uh, why do you, even if you like music, uh, why do you like other people to play it for you? Can't you do it in your own head? Uh, why do you listen to an orchestra? Just think of the orchestra, maybe 60 instruments all playing slightly different things at once. You can't really hear all that, can you? Uh, wouldn't it be better to have just one or two instruments coming right to the point instead of 60 of them dancing around. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, <laughs> the last little clip, clip just shows how he was pushed and pulled, I think, his whole life between 
being moved by music and realizing how profound it was and being suspicious of music and how music grabs us and pushes us places that maybe we don't want to be. Something most people who talk about music aren't willing to admit and certainly most musicians aren't. So here's the last one. Uh, if music makes you feel good or feel bad, uh, why do you like to have some external agent controlling your feelings? Uh, wouldn't you prefer to have control of yourself and uh, do it from inside? Why do you have to hire these professionals to make you sad or happy or bluesy or whatever? Uh, why aren't people more self-contained? It could go on and on. We don't have time to. Just uh, end with one little story, um, which is that I remember when I was just starting out as a professor at MIT, um, I was lucky I spent a lot of time with Marvin, and I realized what a special re relationship he had with all of his students. And I asked him one day, um, you know, what's the secret of being a great mentor? I mean, or, or, or maybe I said, what's the secret of just being a successful professor? I don't know what I said. And, um, and he answered, he said, the most important thing is just to make sure that your students feel that all the great ideas are theirs. And, and in, in thinking about these comments today, I realized that almost all the ideas I have about music, um, most of them, most of the good ones, in fact, come from Marvin. And I think many of us feel that about our fields and our relationship to Marvin. Um, I'll end with just a little transition to uh, Nicholas Negroponte, which is, uh, I think, the quintessential uh, Marvin Minsky. This is a video that uh, Margaret took backstage at uh, Mike Holy's EG conference. Um, well, you'll see Marvin. I think it doesn't need an explanation. Here we go.
okay, I knew that everybody will have told the stories, and I knew we'd be running late, so I'm going to be very short. And what I'd like to do primarily is thank Marvin for something faculty and students may not realize. But before I do that, perhaps unlike anybody else who spoke, I was actually not Marvin's student. And when I joined the faculty of MIT, I joined in the Department of Architecture, and arguably I was not even his colleague. And what we were were friends. And our friendship was built around cooking. You may not think of Marvin as a cook, but Seymour was a cook, and Marvin and Seymour were sort of a package deal in those days, and we did a lot of cooking. And many of the famous people you've heard about would come to dinner, and we'd do things that were very complicated. Uh, we'd do a roast suckling pig, and, and Seymour was reading the Julia Child's recipe that said, tuck the tail in the little hole below it. And, <laughs> Things and we'd all burst out laughing, and Marvin would say, oh, let's remove the eyeballs to see if there's an image on the back of the eyeball. <laughs> so, and through this sort of thing, we developed a, a friendship with his family, with his children, and, and I first personally felt very close. And as, as we were starting to build the Media Lab and have the idea for it, the thank you is that when you were 35, 36, 37, sort of the age I was when I started the Media Lab, you can only be so crazy because you're going to kind of be dismissed or written off. But we hid, if you will, behind Marvin's license to be legitimately kind of crazy. And he could do things. And we benefited not just from the fact that he would attract all sorts of people, which he did. And as David Levitt said, he was a very major element in making the Media Lab even more exciting. But as time went on, Marvin did something else. And, and beyond thanking him, I want to sort of almost speak for him. Speak for him to students who are here, students who are even thinking of coming, faculty who are doing things. I always enjoyed the fact that Marvin would take an accepted point of view and have the completely opposite one. So you say, everybody agrees with x. And Marvin sort of says, well, no, it's this. And in thinking about today, there's something happening now that everybody thinks is the right way to go and I think is totally wrong. And I think if Marvin were here, he'd not only say it, but let me tell you what I think it is. The world today doesn't think about big, hard problems the way it used to. There's this idea that we can do this. There's a concept that I keep hearing. People say, fail fast. What a stupid idea, <laughs> fail fast. Why would you ever fail fast? Because when you fail, you just try harder. And some of the principles today are competing against doing hard problems. And what Marvin taught at least me to do is the only problem worth working on are very hard long-term problems. And we've got to be doing it more and more and ever after. And thank you, Marvin, for that, and thank you for many, many things like it. Thank you. So um, <laughs> we've passed the uh, three hour point, which means this truly is a brain opera. And um, I want to tell you a little story. How many family are in the room or who would consider themselves family? Raise your hands. All of you come on up here and I'll tell this story. Gloria told me this story, so it's OK to tell. Some of you may even know it. Let's get you all up on this stage here. Uh, apparently when Gloria and, uh, and Marvin were dating, and Gloria's going to make it up here too, so that means you all come. Gloria was kind of a 
folksy sort. I mean, of course, she was a very cultured and educated woman, but uh, uh, she would sing occasionally. And she described this time on a beautiful day, driving in the car. Marvin was driving. And Gloria was singing this particular song. And uh, she was obviously very happy. And both of them were very happy. And one can only imagine what kind of car they were driving in back then, so long ago. And, the big doors you'd put your arms on, the roll-up windows. And Marvin turned to her and said, I really like that song. I like the way you sing that song. And I asked Gloria when we were preparing this event, I said, is there any song that uh, you, you can recall that you kind of would sing together, or a song that's important of any kind? And uh, she said, well, there is one song. And I've been thinking of it recently because I remember reading the beginning of uh, Emotion Engine, or Emotion Machine. And, uh, and at the beginning of Emotion Machine, it, it, one of the, the, sh the beginning chapter, I believe, is falling in love. It's all about falling in love. And then when you fall in love, you suspend your critical faculties. And that the, the critical faculties that allow you to judge what is good or grand or fabulous or not so grand go out the window, and suddenly you start to appreciate and love wonderful things that you might never have noticed before. And, and Gloria said she, she always wondered if that meant that when Marvin said, I really like the way you sing that song, being in love with her as he was at that moment, that he had somehow suspended his critical faculties. <laughs> I know nothing about the kind of work that Marvin did. And I'm a college dropout. But I can say that the song Green Sleeves that I'm going to ask you to sing now is a beautiful song. Assuredly, Gloria sang it beautifully then. And let's all sing it together now. Check the lyrics for all of you. Alas, my love, you do me wrong to cast me off discourteously. For I have loved you well and long, delighting in your company. Green sleeves was all. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks to all of you. On the fifth floor, there will be an opportunity for you to participate in a video diary by telling your own stories of Marvin Minsky. And the song that you will hear on the way out is written by Marvin Minsky himself. Thank you.